This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome aboard with another Sunset Safari. We are coming to you live from the Juma Traverse in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. We're watching a beautiful starling up in a tree out on Chitwa, and my name is Ralph Kirsten. On the camera, we've got Fergus. How's it, Fergus? Now, please don't forget to join us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. Send us your questions and your comments and join us on this interactive safari. Now, it's a lovely warm afternoon, mid-20 degrees Celsius, sort of mid-70 degree uh, Fahrenheit, and so it's um, a nice warm start to the afternoon safari. Little bit of a breeze coming through, and we have come out, we've just left the Juma Traverse and come out on to Chitwa Chitwa. We're just looking out towards the waterhole, um, down towards the lodge, but um, I've received some fantastic news just before we came out, and uh, in a little while I've got a very nice surprise for you. But for now, we've just been watching some birds. We can hear the fish eagles calling out there, and I'll tell you also that Rafiki Dave, he's going to be driving around on the Juma Traverse, looking for Tingana initially, seeing if if you can catch up with him again from this morning when Steve found him and I think it's also Taylor out on foot and she's going to be doing her best to find some tracks and little things and get closer to all of that and speaking of Taylor I believe she can't wait to say hello just very quickly trying to so sense all that I can see a bushveld's hand lizard my name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me is obviously Senzel, as I said. And Rexon is out keeping an eye on us today. It's still there. Can you see it? Okay, Senzel can see it. I can't see where it's run. I took my eyes off of it for two seconds. And I think it's moved. I'm going to shuffle around. How cool is this? There it is. It's so beautiful. It's so fat. Look how fat it is. That's awesome. That's really nice to see. I mean, look at around the, the sort of midriff section. I wonder if this is maybe a female. Maybe she's got eggs inside of her that she's going to lay. Unless this little lizard has also had a big meal. That wouldn't surprise me too with all the insects that are about, lots of flies and things. For it to catch lots of termites, I'm sure they eat too. They'll eat a variety of different types of lizards. Now, <clears throat> if it is your first time joining us on a bushwalk, welcome. Hashtag Safari Live. If you'd like to ask any questions, you can also use the YouTube chat. There we go. Lizard, are you off to go and chat to everybody? I think so. I think that lizard might have some eggs inside of it. It was really, really, really quite round. Now, what we're going to be doing this afternoon is, um, obviously I wasn't on drive this morning. I'm well rested. Had my beauty sleep, it was so nice. And um, I heard that there were lots of exciting things happening on Bushwalk. And Rexon has just said to me, he says, Hukamori is on the property. We are going to find him this afternoon. So that's really going to be our plan. So in order for us to try and get into the area, which I have no idea where we're going, we're just sort of walking west now. We're going to walk down, cent uh, not central. We are going to walk. We're not going to step on the termites. Look at all the harvester termites. They're so busy. We're going to walk on the road, that's what I was going to say. And then look, this is awesome. This is so great. I haven't seen harvested termites for quite some time. They're out working at the moment. And I can tell that they are harvested termites just because they don't have a big mound. They make their, their mounds underneath the ground. And then this is very typical to see all the grass on the outside. So the workers will be racing around as quick as they can, going to chop blades of grass and bring them back. And then they drop them here. They drop them and then they carry on. Some of them will carry on, drag their piece of grass all the way in. I don't think that that's necessary because there are other workers waiting to then take on, well, the, the next part process where they will take that down into a chamber. That's so cool. There are lots of them though. Look, they've got two tunnels. This one seems to, obviously the one we were looking at, it was the most active. This one, I'm not sure what's going on here. There's a bit of debris. Look, there's some, there's a piece of uh, sawtooth lovegrass. There's the seed that you can see. They don't seem to be doing much at all here, but they're coming in from everywhere. Look at this one, Senzel. How big is this leaf? Wow. 
No, there we go. Sorry, I was getting in Senzel's way. That's amazing. It just goes to show you how how strong these creatures really are. I mean, that. No, no. Oh, what are you doing? I don't know what just happened. It dropped its leaf. It shouted at another one, and now it's running back again. You know, I don't really know what happened there. Bit of a, a bit of a dispute. But anyway, nice to see the termites out and working on a very warm winter's day. I bet they're going to make the most of this nice warm weather before it gets too cool. Okay, well, we're going to let these termites carry on with their hard work. We're going to march on down the road. But I believe that David has a baby in Yala. Good afternoon everyone and we just saw a very young baby Nyala here with the mother and my name is David and with me is Craig. Very excited to have you. We're just going to move forward a little bit. We just saw a mother and a baby Nyala, very young one and they just moved forward and how beautiful to see such a tiny baby Nyala here and there's a male not far from where we are. Maybe we reverse now. She's just, I think, hiding because of the baby. Let's find out what they have just hidden. And she was just suckling a few seconds ago. Uh, keep going back. She just took some cover. And if you look carefully there, you can see the hind legs and the baby's there. And she's just nursing there. It's, I think the tiniest baby from Anyala I have seen. And I might have got a question the other day if baby Nyalas are born in stripes, and I think this is a clear answer. They're born stripy, and the mother is like, you have to stop tiny baby trying to follow the mom. And there's a male that just came in close by there, and you're going to pull back again, that's the male there. I don't know if they interrupted the suckling. Because of the heat of the day now, they're staying under the shed just to cool off and regurgitating and definitely be eating much later. So let me back up again and see if we'll have a chance to see that baby again. This is the Muromati River. Okay, we are out of the sand. And we'll move forward and see what they can see this baby. And the mother suckling, she's so tiny. It's one of the youngest baby nyalas I have seen and so she'll continue suckling she's still suckling the only thing is I don't know whether she'll have a good view of that she has gone right into the thickets let's see if they can get a small place to open up Debbie you say that was so cute thank you very much Debbie it was really cute I haven't seen such a small tiny baby nursing Hopefully the mother will give us another profile. Yes, Debbie, that was very cute. And especially seeing the baby nursing is pretty special. So there are a couple of females here, young ones, and they are very good job there. She's following the mother very closely. And like, it's time to suck, give me a chance. I need some milk, I'm still growing. Okay, there. Excellent. Very good camera work there, Craig. Thank you very much. So it's funny, the baby is nursing and the mother is regurgitating. So everybody's busy eating. This is interesting world. How sweet is this, eh? Again, as I said earlier, I had got a question, I think, either yesterday or the day before, if the Vinyalas are born in stripes, I was to confirm that, and yes, they are born in stripes. Leah, how old would that baby be? I would guess about four or five months, Leah, I would, but that's just a sheer guess, four or five months, from what I can see, four or five months, Leah, that is uh, just a wild guess, Leah. And seeing that she's, you know, she's still nursing, she has not been, you know, the mother hasn't winded the baby. See how she's pushing the mother, she keeps nursing. How beautiful is this? And no wonder we have the male around here, just making sure not 
exactly the reason, but just making sure everything is safe. Must be a very hungry baby. And very good lighting in the mother. Now it's more cooperative than before, and she's just allowing the baby to keep nursing. Funny, I don't know whether every time they do a big push like that, that one enhances more milk to come out. Roma baby nyalas, I think they're born about 10 kilograms, I would guess, about 10 kilos when they're born. And at the moment, I don't know how old that would be, but that's basically about their weight when they're born. Quite big babies, I would say 5 to 10 kilos would be the weight from it when the babies are born. And fully grown males would be about 110 kilos and the females would be about 60. Let's say about 5 kilos could be about the weight of it, could be the average weight of a baby nyala. That could be my guess. 5 kilos or so, 3 to 5 kilos is a better guess than 10. 10 was a bit too much. So say 3 to 5 kilos is not a bad guess for baby nyala. So if the fully grown adults are about 110 and the females are 60, so anything three to five kilograms from it should be a good guess. Very nice to see how the mother just stop there and allowing the baby to keep nursing. More often than not, they'll always have one baby. Very few cases they have recorded twins is always one and anything between six or seven months, this baby should be weaned. So I still think it could be about three or four months. She's still got another two or three months to keep nursing. Stops, looks, and the mother makes a move. And enjoying this nice surprise here of a baby Nyala nursing, I think Raf might have another good surprise. Well, everyone, this is the surprise I was talking about. We've managed to catch up to Tandi. That is that spotted thing that's breathing down there in the thick grass. And she has managed to make herself a little kill here on Chitwa Chitwa. Um, she killed a young bushbuck this morning. And Tlalamba is also in the area. So we're going to try our best to get some better uh, visuals on her. But we're just starting here for the moment. You can see how she's panting. She's probably had quite a bit to eat already. We have spotted the little young cub Tlalamba in the thicket as well. But uh, she's hiding herself for now, uh, just next to where the little bushbuck is, that is now dead and having been fed on. So there is Tandi. It's been a while since I've caught up with her, so I am very happy. And I think we'll spend a little bit of time here. Then in a moment, uh, we'll try and get a view on little Tlalamba. We'll go down and uh, visit the waterhole at Chitwa Chitwa and then maybe return a bit later when it's cooled down a bit and she might show herself a bit better. But wonderful that we've been able to catch up with her again. The beautiful daughter of Karula and uh, either Mfufunyan or Yodan, the male, uh, not quite sure which exact uh, of the two was the father but she was born in December of 2006 so she's a good old age is Tandi and had a couple of sets of cubs um, to name a few being Kuchava, Tamba and now Tlalamba the little female cub that was born in November last year so quite a successful mother has she been the beautiful Tandi, very traditional um, Orsa, Zulu and Shangan name, local name for uh, girls here in South Africa. 
And uh, it's one of those names like a Richard or a uh, Robert, if you would say, in English. Tandi, a very classic Zulu Tosa Shangan name. So she is one of those classic leopard females. Beautiful how you see how she blends in so well with the grass. And I hope that you are as happy as I am to have found her. And I'm sure she'll be relaxing a little bit after she's had a nice feed. And shortly I will try my best to try and get a better view of her. There's another vehicle here. Obviously, lots of people very excited that uh, she has been spotted now. And I was driving around yesterday looking for her around Biffle's Hook. And so she's come along Cheetah Cut Line um, and headed quite a way south from where she was normally hanging around. Maybe because there wasn't too much in the way of food. So she's come down towards Chitwa Chitwa Waterhole where there's quite a lot more animals um, frequenting, especially around the waterhole here. So maybe that's why she moved this distance. And I wonder if she brought her cub along with her initially or if she's made this kill and then gone and fetched it. Now that weeping wattle there is where the kill is and where little Tlalamba is also hiding. So not fantastic uh, views on all of these uh, subjects, but we know they're here and I'm going to be spending some time and trying to get us better views on them as the, more, as the afternoon progresses. But wonderful that we could start with this initial uh, sighting and news that uh, I got from the other guides that passed the message along. So I have to say my thanks to them. Taylor passed it on from somebody uh, else from the Chitwa Chitwa side of things. It's actually um, Brent's brother who works at Chitwa Chitwa. Passed the message on to Taylor and Taylor passed it on to me. A wonderful bush telegraph. It's uh, all spreading and sharing the knowledge and the experiences and the sightings and we all then make for a better experience for all of our guests and so yeah I'm going to now try and get us a better view from the other side but the secret is now out we have Tandi and Tlalamba so thank you Taylor and over to her very exciting I'm so happy because she's been MIA for so long now we have a little fly it is a robber fly. I'm hoping it's just going to keep still and keep landing. And just as we found it, it was trying to kill a little black beetle of sorts. It didn't look like a stink bug. It's something else, another type of bug that I've been seeing around, but I have yet to be able, uh, be able to positively identify it. So it lost its meal. The beetle fought back. And now I think it's just there feeling a little bit sorry for itself. Maybe it's going to wait for another little beetle. Now, they're very powerful flies. They're quite large in comparison to some of the other flies. It was all a very different shape. They're very sort of elongated. And they've got a very, very sharp proboscis. I think it flew again, eh? Can you still see it? I keep losing it. My eyes are not quick enough. Senzel's on it, though. He's on the money this afternoon. I'm hoping we're going to see another little beetle scurry across and we can actually watch it catch something. It was amazing. This beetle was maybe not quite the, the size of the of the fly, maybe half the size of, of this robber fly. It was pretty phenomenal. It was wrestling it to the ground and this beetle was just fighting back and it got away. And actually, I don't think it's too far from there. Let's see if we can find it while you're there. I'm sure I saw it run here somewhere, actually here. It isn't hiding. I'd also be hiding if I was a rob robber, f uh, if I was hiding from a robber fly. It was somewhere in here. It was pretty amazing. It was a little black, well, not little because it was quite big. Anyway, it's gone now. It's hiding quite well. Probably just very camouflaged under a leaf or something. But not a very, very nice fly. Not one that you want to be bitten by either. They'll draw blood. They ooh, love to feed on blood. Um, <clears throat> so we've been just watching 
checking down on the roads to see if there's any tracks, but we haven't found any more tracks just yet. It's going to be important for us to utilise the roads this afternoon, just until we can get back onto the tracks of Hukumuri, who is a male leopard. And um, hopefully once we've picked up on those tracks, then we can sort of figure out where on earth he's gone. Now, unless Hukumuri has a kill, he's not really known to sort of stay in the same spot. He does quite a bit of moving around. So maybe he's here. Maybe he's got a kill that we just don't even know about. So that is going to be the plan this afternoon. I'm glad we're seeing a couple of insects, though. It's definitely been a, a while, so that's something we'll keep an eye on for. I'll keep checking all the blades of grass. I'll check under the leaf litter. It's a nice warm afternoon. Maybe even the chances for a snake. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Right, somebody else that's also looking for a big male leopard is David, and I don't know if he's any closer to where Tsangana was. Your yeah, snake would be a good surprise. The other day, we saw a black mamba, which was uh, quite interesting, and it was a pretty long one, you know. It was just on the road, stood there for like a whole three, five minutes looking at us. We kept looking at it, and then, you know, it just bugger off, went sway. That was interesting. This area where we are now, the Duke of Tingana, uh, the Duke of Tingana has resurfaced, and he was seen around here in the morning, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do and find out whether I would be able to see him. He was seen around this area, and that was in this morning. And I would remind him, because of the heat of the day now, he could be lying somewhere in your know, such bushes there, or under the trees there, on that drainage line. And most likely, we're gonna wake him up and find out, you know, what he's doing. But it's this area where he was found this morning and left there, and mostly, unless otherwise when it's hot, like now, leopards will tend to stick to the same area and only move if they have to and drink either very early in the morning or late in the evening. So my plan is to go around and just make sure I comb the whole of this area, leaving no chance of anything uh, behind just in case we don't miss him. He has not been seen for the last couple of days. It has been Hukumuri's world, but then Tingana is back. So those are my plans now and find out whether he could be lying anywhere here. He ended up going in the thickets and he was followed very well during the day and I'm sure somehow he will pop up and I'm trying to look for any drinking area in a drinking hole See, if he went for a drink, chances are he just laid close to that watering hole. Anything that would have some water now could be a good chance of him having laid down. Still imagining what could happen if they would meet with Hukumuri. Costa Spider, your question is, what do I think is the cutest of all the animals? Let me see, let me see. I could be wrong, but I think I would say cheetah cubs. What do you think of that? Cheetah cubs, I think, to me, are so cute when they're very fluffy and shortly maybe before they open their eyes and they're full of hair, and you can't see the spots. The spots are way inside there, and the fur is just out. And you see them struggling, just like the normal kitty cat at home. I would say for me, cheetah cubs could be like, for me, the cutest of them all. But that's my guess. I think, yeah, cheetah cubs could be the favorite for me. Baby elephants too, baby elephants too. The thing is, I'm trying to compare size. Yes, that's a good question there, Cassie. Trying to compare size, baby elephants also look good. If I look at the big mammals, I would say for the elephants, well, big mammals, elephants, babies are pretty cute. If I would look at cats, I would say cheetahs are lovely to watch, when they're, especially when they're brand new, when I would say about, what, 10 weeks old, when they're just trying to come out of their den or where they were born, and the mother's trying to make them, you know, out and join and see the world. Baby elephants, a brand new one, is also another interesting one to see. Linda, baby wild ducks, I don't know. Baby wild ducks are rather difficult to see. I haven't seen 
when they're born and when they're young and try to imagine how they would look like. But I think they would be cute too. Maybe all the dogs could be cute too. Looking at their different colors before the spot patterns start forming, I think, Linda. Baby wild dogs be good. I would say maybe, Linda, instead of uh, baby wild dogs, why don't we agree on hyenas? Because hyenas, once they're born and they're young, they're all one color. In general, they're always dark in color. They're all black. So if I would be given a choice of the two, I would say hyenas because I've seen them. I don't know how baby wild dogs should look when they're very young, Linda. Stick with the uh, baby wild dogs and then stick with the higher, with the hyenas and talking of babies rough got a baby leopard mm -hmm. the beautiful little tralamba look at that speaking of cuteness well you wouldn't be far wrong if you said that a baby leopard is one of the cutest animals around i would have to to close tie for me for first place baby leopards and baby elephants that would have to be my favorite uh, i do tend to lean towards elephants just because of my extensive experience with them but well looking at this little girl um how could i not say that they're up there definitely she's obviously had a little bit of a feed on this um young bushbuck that Tandi expertly killed this morning and as I was saying a little bit earlier I wonder if she brought Tlalamba with her for the kill or if once she made the kill she went and fetched her that I don't know but uh, they're both now sitting quite deep in the grass and uh, it is amazing how well they blend in and you see little Tlalamba just keeps still in the grass there. Oh, as she moves her head to the side. What are you thinking, little girl? Hey? She's very pretty. And you can see that very cub-like fur. Ashley, you are very right, hey? She's a very pretty girl. She's just slinking now through the grass. I wonder what she's up to going deeper in there she doesn't want to be seen she's going a little bit around the side she's about 20 meters away from mum and now she's just slinking away through the grass there there she goes what you up to girl i won't be moving until she settles she seems to be shifting around a little bit and looking back at us so maybe she's not too happy with us so we'll just let her relax before we do anything i want to see if she's got a fat belly i'm sure she's had a feed see she's doing that leopard crawl the leopard walk very low to the ground keeping inconspicuous but there we get a nice view on her that very characteristic white tip on the end of the tail i think she's going around towards tundi see probably wants to see mum. So, uh, there she's slinking around. Just making her way through the bush. There she goes. Slowly but surely. Oh. She ran back into where the kill is. She's getting a little bit playful here. That was very cool. Because slinking 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 and then and there's just the tip of her tail showing out there not sure if you can see it there Ferg, with that burnt piece yeah somewhere there there's her tail now it's gone in uh, i wonder if she's having a feed yeah i can hear a bit of crunching i don't want to disturb her but i also want to try and get a view uh, there she, no, but that's that's mom over there. I can still see Tlalamba. I wonder if mom told her off. Looks like a fat belly there, yep. Yeah. So that's Tandi. She went towards the kill and now Tlalamba has settled again. I think she was told off by mom there, but it looked like Tlalamba was going for a little bit of a play. And now mom said, get back to where you came from. 
and just be quiet. I think, you know, very often the cubs can get quite playful and they need to be just kept in line by the adults sometimes because, uh, well, there's no second chances out here in the bush. And if anything had to spot her, lion or hyena wise, uh, her days would be numbered. So, very clever from mom, just keeping her in line, very often like that. And it's a shame we're not getting a clear view on them, but uh, this, we just need to be a little bit patient. And I'm sure we are going to get a nice view sooner or later. I'm sure mom's going to come across. We'll go back just now and get a view on her again. As I say, she's hidden in this bush buck very deep inside this thicket here, fallen over a tree and uh, a weeping wattle there. You can see those compound leaves on the weeping wattle. One of the tree that we call the toilet paper bush, because if you were in the bush and you needed some, uh, you needed to go to the toilet, and you didn't have any toilet paper, well, that is the leaves that we would use. Not to be confused with the flame thorn, because, uh, yeah, that's exactly what it would do to your bottom is uh, make it feel like it's on fire with the thorns that it's got and it looks identical to the African weeping wattle. All right, and that's not the best view, is it? Let me maybe just try and get us a little bit forward and we are going forward but away from the sighting so we shouldn't disturb by doing that but let me reposition and try get you all a better view and um well i'll do my best anyway but let's send you on over to the bushwalk team in the meantime struggling to find the insects this afternoon we keep checking the leaves of the silver cluster leaf trees because they seem to be the most prominent tree growing around here in this area but nothing just a couple of ants here and there now I still don't know what's been feeding on these leaves. Look at them. Look at all those holes on the leaves there. Something's been gobbling them up. Oh, I see I have some kind of a thing on my hand. What is on my hand, Senzo? Can you see that? Oh, never mind. It's gone now. Apparently that little thing could fly. It looks like a, a thrip with wings, but I don't think it was a thrip. Anyways, um, Coast Sider, you've asked, what do I think is the cutest baby animal? I'm going to have to go with a little hippopotamus, just hippopotamus, because they are really cute. I don't know how that's even um, a hard question to answer. I thought everybody's answer would be a little hippopotamus. Now, I favor the elephants all the time, and I think that the, a little elephant calf is very cute too, but, but a baby hippopotamus, when it porpoises out of the water, they always look like they're smiling at you and they open their mouths and all you can see are gums. Oh, they're so precious. And because Ralph is going down, of course, the Chip Chitwa Dam, I have absolutely no doubt that you're going to see that very new hippopotamus that was well, probably only uh, uh, a couple of weeks old now. So that'll be quite sweet. And hopefully it gets up and uh, well, starts bouncing around for all of you so that we can, you can all agree that a baby hippopotamus is the sweetest. So, we are still looking for any signs of leopards, but we're almost there. We're almost where the last tracks were seen, so that's good news. And we've also got some giraffe tracks. We're heading in that direction, as well as elephants. But David has a raptor. Right, Taylor. Good luck, and hopefully you're going to get some good trucks that will help us. We've got a huge raptor here, a huge bird of prey, and this is the African hawk eagle. Very characteristic position where she is, but now it's most likely it's a she and a he. And for once, I have seen two together, and my guess this could be a pair, a male and a female. Some huge raptors have been known to be monogamous, but uh, yeah, here I'm seeing African hawk eagle for the first time being together, and my guess is a male and a female. Not very far from each other. And they're huge birds. Initially, when I got here from a distance, we came from a different angle. They looked like the, you know, the martial eagles, but on closer look, found out. It had nothing to do with Marshall Eagle and this African Hawk Eagle. We see them oftenly or quite frequently. But it's the first time I'm seeing 
two together. Quite interesting how they could be staying there waiting quietly to see any movement and maybe by two, I don't know that would help them when they pray for food and they may choose a bigger prey and combine forces because they are two together unlike going for small you know reptiles or small rodents they go for and maybe when they're two they can agree to go for something bigger and not necessarily but I got a feeling by being two together they may choose to go for something bigger maybe like a phone of an impala or a young one of anyala for example and they could combine forces to kill it. I once saw Marshall Eagle trying to harass a big marabou stock. I mean, the bird was so huge. But these were two Marshall Eagles, and one would jump and sit on it, and then the other one would just tear it down using his claws. So once the marabou stock would try to stand up, you see, you know, they got very long legs. The other one just like triple it and bring it down. One would bring it on the head, would lie on the head of it, on the head, and then the other one would just try and tear it from, from the tummy, which could be something very interesting if I could see these African hawk eagles do the same combined forces, which is quite unusual, and they try and bring a prey down. All right, rather quiet African hawk eagles, but good to see two together, which I have not seen for some time. and. Let's move to Raf, who have something that loves to drink water. Well, everyone, I've just decided to leave um, Tandi and Salamba just for a little while, also to allow everybody else to come and have a quick look there. And obviously it's quite sensitive with uh, a little Salamba there, so we keep it to a two-vehicle sighting, uh, so quite sensitive. Um, but speaking of little babies, well, you wouldn't also be far wrong if you had to say that a baby waterbuck is one of the prettiest animals out there. And you very often find waterbuck youngsters in a creche-like group. They, the adults often group them together and leave some of the younger females uh, to look after them. And it really is like a creche because you can have 20, even 30 youngsters all of the same age, all in a big group, just with one or two females looking after them while the rest of them all go off and graze and then uh, return later, especially in the evening, and uh, then all group and band together again. Dyed monkey, exactly. This is a African-style roadblock, and uh, one of the cutest that you could have with, um, with these water bucks. So thanks, dyed monkey. That's a very nice comment that you've sent through. Well, I've had elephant roadblocks and lion roadblocks. Uh, it's been a while since I've had a, a young water, block, uh, water buck roadblock. I'm getting tongue-tied with all this bock, block, block. <laughs> but you see him sticking his tongue up his nose. I often quite enjoy that. I just watch, well, not that I can do it. I wish I could. But um, I often see the buffalo doing it as well. But they, their tongue sort of stays up their nostril for quite a lot longer. And uh, it's quite fascinating. Giraffe also with their very long tongues as well. Very often goes right up their nostril. And I think it's just itchy. And, uh, you know, the flies and things also get in their nose. Oh, there's Pumba coming in the background saying hello. And at least he's come to us for a change. Oh, there we go. Never lasts long, does it? The piggies. There was Pumba in the back. Tawny, to answer your question, I would say that these are literally only a couple of months old. So I would say about two to three months. Um, I would probably lean towards three months, uh, four months at the most. So they are quite young. And the one that is sitting right in the middle of the road seems the youngest. Look how big their ears are. And they just look like teddy bears with their very long fur. I've actually seen um, 
the little youngster that's sitting in the middle of the road, I actually once came across um, one that had been killed by an African rock python, and it had swallowed the entire head and right up past the legs, and it was halfway down the body, all the slime. Uh, that that the uh, snake, you know, they've got a lot of slime. When they start to swallow an animal, uh, they have that slime to help lubricate it as it uh, gets swallowed. And I don't know if it was us or something bothered the snake while it was busy swallowing it, and then it uh, spat it out. But it had killed the little water buck and uh, was busy swallowing it but they get they become so vulnerable at that point that anything from a leopard uh, to a crowned eagle could have two meals in one um, and so they very easily do uh, eject what they're trying to swallow but uh, i'm not hoping that for this little youngster but uh, it was quite impressive how that rock python had been able to swallow such a big animal. In the Maasai Mara I actually saw a python that uh, had swallowed a gazelle. So it is quite incredible. They could swallow a small child quite easily. And they, they work by constriction. So they don't squeeze the life out of um, an animal. It's, uh, it's literally, they do constrict. So they tighten and, and wrap around an animal. And then as it breathes out, they tighten again. Each time it breathes out, tighten. Breathe out, tighten. So there's literally, eventually, it's, it's um, a form of suffocation because the animal can't breathe in. But they don't literally wrangle or squeeze the life out of an animal. It's just each time there's a space, they tighten up. Anyway, enough about death. This uh, beautiful young water buck is lovely. Angie, they are as soft as they look. That hair is very soft, um, but they do have quite a smell about them. It's quite uh, musty, musky, should I say. And uh, you can really smell when, when you're driving, you all of a sudden get this musky smell. And uh, it's, it's very often the water buck have run across the road in front of you. And they've got these glands that, it's almost like a preen gland that you have on birds. Um, and they, they, that's uh, it assists them in making their, their fur very oily, so that uh, it's a form of waterproofing, uh, water resistance, and, and because of their habits of being around and in water, it does assist them with that. It must, however, make them quite hot in the, on the summer days because they've got this big coat on them. Although you know you can have insulation that can keep you cool and warm when it's required. So it might actually assist. You know, I often used to think as well, you know, I'd leave my arms bare in, um, when I was very young. Yeah, we want to get suntanned and look all cool, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but I find now that actually having a light cotton shirt over my arms and over my body um, actually keeps me cooler than if I was exposed directly to the sun. And the same in winter, obviously. But, the, you know, that, that goes without saying. But actually staying cooler with extra cover um, sometimes uh, you wouldn't think that that actually occurs so i i don't know maybe these water buck actually are the coolest chaps in town that they're staying cooler than the rest even though they have thicker coats a little bit of insulation never goes amiss but they are cute aren't they very very cute and we've seen quite a lot of water buck around in the area um, but the adults all off grazing at the moment. It's pretty quiet down by the waterhole. I see there's uh, the ever-present hippos down there. But I'm just waiting for these water buck to give us a chance that we could drive down the road. And so it's at their leisure. Gemma, um, well, I think very far uh, down the line, um, a water buck might be very distantly related to donkeys, but um, they they more on the, the horse family are donkeys. So closer closer related to them um, and, and uh, the uh, zebras and so on. Um, the water buck more with the antelope. So they also get the horns and so on. So... These are undulates and a uh, little bit removed from from the the horses and the donkeys. So, but yes, it, eventually all the way down the line they would have probably come from a similar origin. 
but uh, it's quite far removed. And it looks like they now are very obligingly giving me the space to drive down the road. I think they might be listening to me. So that's quite interesting. But you'll see with Waterbuck, they've also got two toes. Um, so they are even-toed ungulates, whereas the um, horses, the donkeys, um, they've all got the one toe. So they're odd-toed ungulates. But uh, part of the ungulates anyway. So as I say, quite distantly related, but not uh, very close. Almost like uh, fourth or fifth cousins, as opposed to being close blood relatives. Anyway, I think I'm going to make myself uh, make my way down to the waterhole. Um, let's head back to the bushwalk team and see what little clues and signs they've been able to find. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Kirsty was desperately trying to feed across the link from Ralph, but failed miserably. Kirsty, are you still alive? Beep the radio twice if you are still breathing. She's alive. I don't know what happened if you took a sip of tea or coffee or water, or maybe she was just choking on her own saliva. Oh, no, not even liquid. Kirsty was choking on a piece of popcorn. She's all right, though. Everything's okay. I think uh, maybe the kernel went down, well, the wrong pipe. We're glad you're okay. You had us worried there. I was going to say, I don't know who can do first aid. Eggsy? Can Eggsy do first aid? Is he a qualified first aider? Would he have been able to have performed a Heimlich maneuver? Jerry's bouncing around on her big blow-up ball, so I don't know if she would have been much help this afternoon. Anyways, so we've got this beautiful tree here called a buffalo thorn, and it's actually growing in and amongst a lot of different trees. There's russet bush willow here and a few other things too, little plants. But anyways, this, this one doesn't seem to be doing too well. It's struggling. It's creeping through the, the russet bush willow. Maybe it's actually a good idea trying to conceal itself because I think that the, between the elephants, the kudu, the bushbuck, the inyala, the impala, anything that really eats leaves hasn't really given this tree much of a chance to grow. It's, um, it's sort of dwarfed, and I think it has been the elephants that have been here, just because I can see some of these branches have actually been snapped. You see, like that one, it's an old injury. I mean, this is no longer alive, and now I'm... Oh, now I've caught myself. There we go. So there's lots and lots... I keep catching myself. This is a great tree. So lots and lots of broken branches here. So it might have been from an elephant, even a kudu, actually, and a black rhino as well. They often snap branches off so that they can feed on them on the floor too. But um, I, I don't blame all the animals for wanting to eat them. I don't see any particularly new ones. Mm, delicious. Mmm, no. You know what, and as I stand here and chew on these leaves, which I know are really good for the animals, I remember that they have aphrodisiac properties, so... Mm. <laughs> Let's spit them out quickly. <laughs> Before the effect starts taking place. <laughs> now, James, you're wondering why it's called a buffalo thorn. I suppose we, we better reminisce about the... Um, this is a new leaf. I'm going to eat this one. Um... The, the tales of, of the Zizifus macronata, which is the Latin name for it. So here goes the old story. Now, typically, buffalo are very, very tough, strong, not necessarily the, have, having the greatest attitudes. Well, every time I encounter buffalo on foot, they just want to kill me. So we try and keep away from them. Anyways, thank goodness for the lions. And uh, the lions like to eat the buffalo out here. But, um, of course, buffalo don't want to be eaten by the lions. So they try and chase them away by with, with, with brute force. I mean, they're massive creatures in comparison to a lion. And, of course, they're armed with horns. And they will put their heads down and try and stab them and fling them up in their hair. They might even stomp on them with their big old hooves. The other the thing is, is that if there's an entire pride alliance trying to get them, you can't, you, well, you're leaving bits and pieces of your body exposed, aren't you? You can only face somewhere the rest of them can go behind you. So what they would do is not a little sissy buffalo thorn like this, a really, really big one. And we have seen some massive ones. They'll actually reverse straight into uh, the buffalo thorn with their backsides. And buffalo have got exceptionally tough skin. So none of these thorns will do much damage to them at all. 
not compared to my, my thin skin, and um, that will protect them. A lion is not going to want to jump into a buffalo thorn. That's going to hurt them quite a bit. So the buffalo then can fend off the lions with their horns and then, of course, with their big hooves, while their rear end, their backside, is all protected by the buffalo thorn. So that's essentially where it comes from. But it's, no, it's got many different names for all the new viewers out there. It's also called the Blankblar Hakenstierk, so the shiny-leafed wait-a-bit tree, and that's because of the thorns. No, I can't say that five times fast, Kirsty. I don't know if that's a pill spotted owlet or a fork tailed drongo now. There's two. Maybe it's Drongo, it's teasing us. Anyways, so they've got these exceptionally long thorns. Now, I'm not always not too worried about the straight one, that's okay. It's the sneaky hook thorn that you can see just below it. That's the one that really gets you. And that's why it's called the, the wait a bit tree. So first you get stabbed and then you think you're free and you pull away and before you know it, the hook thorn is latched onto your skin. And uh, you literally have to pull your arm away very gently or maneuver the branch in a matter, uh, in, sorry, in a matter, in a way that you can all actually pull it out. Otherwise you're just going to end up making yourself bleed. But it's a very, very cool tree. Now the other thing, this one doesn't have any berries on it though. Maybe it's too young still to be producing any fruit, but they do get a nice berry on them which is starts off as green probably gets to about I don't know about the size of a South African one cent coin not that I think they make those anymore but they get quite small and they've got a little bit of flesh on it but the stone is really really um, prominent now with that stone I don't particularly like the fruit I think it's quite high in tannin and I don't like it the birds love it though but that's fine I'll eat the other types of fruit out here is um, that stone in the Anglo-Boer war was actually roasted and then crushed down and used as a coffee substitute now I know Steve has been trying all sorts of wonderful things perhaps we need to try and collect him a couple of uh, all stones maybe we can roast them on his little gas fire and um, see how it goes and um, see if it does the trick I don't know maybe it will work maybe it won't anyways I'm gonna try and swallow this leaf now and uh, we're gonna keep on walking trying to find the giraffe the elephants and the leopard that are somewhere in that direction let's go to Rolf I don't know what he's doing but I think he might be a Chitwa Dam Yes, and we are watching one of the fastest little uh, wadier birds next to the water. This is a tiny little plover, three-banded plover to be specific. And it is very busy at its feather maintenance there. It was having a little bath a minute ago, and now it's doing all the preening and getting all the feathers back in place. And look how fast it moves. It's incredible. We almost need a super slow-mo here because... The speed at which it's going is incredible. Look at that. Really getting that beak through all the different feathers. See, shuffling and then realigning everywhere. It's really doing a full makeover. Just like, how quick is that? <laughs> Sometimes when I've got tick bites, I wish I could scratch that fast. And this little guy is really hard at work making itself look very pretty for its partner which is not far from it and there's always these are little monogamous pairs that you generally see and you'll see the other one come into frame in it oh that a little bit of a family feud there didn't quite like it coming that close i think this one is the the female or should i not have said that <laughs> yeah that was definitely getting ready to go out and the male was like all right come on then can we and it was really put in its place very quickly beauty takes time and it is really looking very pretty it's it's wonderful how they do fluff out and put all their feathers in their places it does really take a lot of maintenance for these little birds for all birds in, for that matter and some birds that don't particularly do too much feather maintenance, you can actually pick them out. Like yellow-billed kites, I think is a classic example. They always look a bit scraggly and like their feathers are falling out and they, they don't really do too much maintenance. Even though they migrate and so on, you always see them with their feathers don't look like they've been looked after. And, well, that's not going to happen with these little th three-banded plovers.
Now, some of you who's nine years old, um, lots of birds do like to take uh, little baths um, because it helps get rid of the oil that they get from their preen gland, which helps them be waterproof. So when it rains or if they're running along next to the water, then um, they're nice and waterproof because of that oil that they've got on them. But I'm trying to think which one does the most. Um, it's normally these... Oh, it's really a little bit of a disagreement with these two. Um, the one that does it the most, I would have to say some of the ducks, probably like your yellow-billed ducks and your um, cape teals, you know, that, that's quite important for the, for the water birds to um, have a lot of baths and clean the oil off and, you know, reapply new oil because they're spending most of their time or a lot of the time in the water itself. So they need to have very good feather maintenance. And these guys move so fast. It's incredible how that one's just shifted off now. Now there's another duck, uh, and in fact an Egyptian goose, that's doing exactly the same. But you see how it sticks its head in the water, and then it throws that water over its back, and then it rubs its face there. So it's, it's also doing uh, the e exact thing that I was talking about. See how it puts its head in and then that if you had to put that into real slow-mo you will see how the water then flows right over its back and in so doing it's really getting rid of some of the excess oils. Wiping and then reapplying and all in aid of keeping the feathers very well maintained. Very very pink legs uh, it's in full plumage and we still haven't found the little goslings that went walk about from Biffles Hook Dam. So it's anyone's guess where they've gone. Maybe they're in Sydney's dam, I'm not sure. Haven't seen them down here by Chitwa Chitwa. Now, it is a birding extravaganza here this afternoon because uh, we've got these little three-banded plovers there with the Egyptian goose. And in front of me, I'm just watching a great egret if uh, Ferg will have a look over there it's in the shade but it has moved a little bit and he's on a fishing mission look at him he's moving expertly slowly he's trying to ambush some fish and look at that very sharp long bill that's like a stabbing uh, spear that he'll use and if he spots a fish moving in the shallows there as he's walking very slowly you might if we're very lucky uh, see him wobble his neck and then stab into the water very much like a heron might and they're in the, the same family and well we get the black-headed herons that do it in the sort of marshy areas they mostly eat frogs and insects and all sorts the gray heron the goliath heron and these uh, great egrets they're all very good fishermen as well like the kingfishers the pied kingfisher and the giant kingfisher but a little bit of a different method where the kingfishers would dive from high and um, also having spotted their target from a distance the great egret will literally ambush its prey see walking very very slowly and sometimes shuffling their feet a little bit to try and attract the little fishies in closely and then stab. And we always just have to keep watching patiently because, oh, that looked like he, that was a bit of a dummy strike there. Looks like he might have spotted something. Looks like he might have a go. The, you can see there's fish in front of him. Did you see that? There was a little swirl. Are we going to see this guy catch a fish? You never know because you could sit here for hours because they are so patient. But it looks like he spotted some fish in front of him. And he just needs to go very slowly. See there? There are some fish around. Sometimes they can be too big though as well. But he's moved into the right zone. I think he might get lucky here. There's fish there, buddy. Just got to be patient, and we've got to be patient watching him because he'll do this all day. But you see how he's turned his head as well, so he is watching the target. Is he going to strike? I think he might. And every now and then you just hear the hippos blowing their air out in the background as well. There's lots of them around. 
And it's not going to be disturbing this guy. He's spotted a fish again. Come on. Just needs one to come close enough. And that spear-like bill of his is going to be put into action. There go the hippos chatting away. As I say, we need to have as much patience as the egret. Now, Brett, I agree with you. Thanks for your comment. Patience, 10 out of 10 for this bird. Well, that's the way he survives. Look at the little swirls in front. There are definitely fish there. And see how he's moving forward? He might just get something. But uh, as I say, sometimes... I sit watching these birds for hours. And then if you just turn your head away, you miss the strike. So it's always a bit of a, a bit of a game. And you do need to be as patient as them. It's pretty much like fishing generally, isn't it? You need to have some patience. There's an African monarch just flitted through there, just in front of the egret. There's all sorts. See the fish? There was a dragonfly there too. So there is lots of life here next to the Chetwa waterhole. Just waiting to see if he might get lucky. And you would think that that white um, is not a very good camouflage for him to be walking around uh, trying to hide from the fish. But it actually is because the fish, if they're looking up into the light, um, it blends in well with the sunlight as a back a backlight, you know. So they actually are very well camouflaged being white. And you'll see with the, e with the herons as well, they've got quite a white belly too. So when the fish is looking up, they're just seeing this bright um, white color from, uh, as they would from the sun. Obviously, if it's overcast, they might find it a bit more difficult because then there's a much bigger contrast and the fish will see them coming. Now, there's a little egret that is very similar to this great egret. Um, it's the same color, but they've got, we call them fancy feet because they've got yellow toes and they use them as bait. So they'll shimmy them around in the soil, uh, in, the, in that um, soil as like as this one is walking. And then you have little fish coming to actually bite on their toes because they think it's food. And then they can stab them right there. And then you get the little black egret, which literally folds its wings out and makes shade. And so the fish come under that shade and um, it will like as cover. And, uh, and then it darts inside which, with that same spear-like bill. Very, very similar form of uh, catching food and fishing throughout with all of them uh, well ex especially their physiology their bodies and their bill they all are spear like but they all have a slightly different technique in how to attract the fish or to go to them the great egret like the herons they just use pure patience and stealth like this one is just moving slowly through the shallows and he has spotted some fish but he just needs to get a bit closer maybe maybe there you see that wobbling of the neck is always a good indication that a strike is imminent you often see it with the herons as well keep watching as a blacksmith lapwing comes there in the background he's also just uh, delving into the little soil there he's probably after a little bit of grubs and worms but you do get some freshwater shrimps here as well but uh, as i say this oh maybe maybe no uh, he's gonna carry on <laughs> it's pretty much like throwing your bait in and waiting for a bite Got to be patient. It can be very exciting, but it can also drag on a bit. But there's so much happening here. It's, I love watching these guys. I'm a fisherman myself, so I've got no problem in having a bit of patience and waiting it out. Because the catch is normally worth the wait. A romet. Um, I would have to say that these, some of these Egyptian geese 
are some of the biggest fighters of the lot uh, because they do fight a lot between them. Uh, they're quite territorial and they're, and they're often a lot of them in the same space. So you do see Egyptian geese fighting and not only with themselves, with, uh, with other birds as well. They sort of chase everybody away. Oh, that egret now had a little bit of grooming while he trying to catch up with those fish again. Every now and then you just see him refocus. Come on, let's see a, let's see a stab. There are so many fish here. I think he's just trying to find the perfect one. Yes, this is a, Kirsten saying this is like watching Hukamuri hunt the other day with Steve. And that was a very long hunt that he had. And it's quite similar, hey? Just a different animal. But they're so graceful the way that they walk. And it's always in, intriguing. And Larry, you say that he needs a, a lesson from Hukumuri. Well, um, he's, he's using a similar tactic. You always got to have patience uh, because he seems quite experienced at this. And he hasn't, he hasn't gone for a, a dive, a, a stab yet. So he's waiting for the perfect moment. And you often find the, the inexperienced ones, they'll start stabbing all over the place. But this guy, he obviously knows... So, as I say, we could sit here and it could be imminent. It might not be imminent. It's, you just never know. And I guarantee you, I'm going to send you on over to Taylor now. And as soon as you go over to her, he's going to make the kill. It's just in typical bird fashion. Now, look at this deep hole we've got ourselves here. Now, this was actually created about two days ago. And I suspect it uh, was dug out by an aardvark. We're right on the road. This is actually really dangerous. It's a hazard because if you don't know that it's here, you're going to drive straight down into that hole. Now, for those of you that have never uh, ever been able to see an aardvark before, an earth pig is the translation is, is direct, um, maybe you've seen them in zoos and things like that, or an anteater. Now, the ones down in South Africa can get massive. I mean, a big male can weigh in excess of 60 kilograms. That's a, it's a really big mammal. And, um, I mean, they're obviously quite small. Not small, but I mean, they're quite low down to the ground. We're standing at about this tall, big hump on their back, big ears, and a long snout. I don't know how it reached all the way down in there and dug inside that hole. That, to me, is really impressive. So that's how I know that it's not a honey badger, that it's not a um, porcupine is because I think this thing was going not going after roots, it was going after insects. And a honey badger would never dig down like this. They also don't have powerful, they've got powerful claws, but an aardvark has got much better claws adapted for digging right down into the hard concrete-like structure of a termite mound. It must have, there must be a harvested termite mound or something around here, because there's a couple of diggings. I want to now see how deep this is. Oh, no. I don't know if I'm going to be able to... Please don't let there be any snakes. Almost to China, says Kirsty. Oh my goodness, okay, my feet are right at the bottom now. And this is, well, pretty much my entire body is uh, most of it. The bulk of it is now down in this hole. Well, this is crazy. I can't really stand because it's quite narrow at the bottom, so I'm just using my arms to help me to sort of stay upright but that is insane i cannot believe i would love to know how long it took this aardvark to dig this hole and i really would have loved to have watched something like this i think that they could probably dig out quite a bit of sand at a fairly rapid rate but you know what i did rescue a velvet ant from here a little while ago it was trying to climb up i think <laughs> i don't want to meet the rest of the family so i think i'm gonna to have to try and get out now <laughs> i'm good um, Larry, yes, they do. Aardvark do often get taken by the cats. You know, I've actually seen uh, lions feeding on Aardvark a couple of times, especially down in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, where I'm, uh, where I'm from. Um, there are a lot of them down there. And actually, that's probably where I've had the best sightings, the most sightings of an Aardvark before was down in the Eastern Cape. And the lions there used to take them all the time. I'm sure it happens out here as well. Okay, now, I don't know, Senzo, maybe I'm just going to have to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm too scared to let go because I'm going to slide. Okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Okay, I'm going to dust myself off now, but another animal that likes to cover themselves with dust is with David.
Yes, and also Ellie's like covering themselves with dust. And look at that mother and calf. They just came from the bush and found us in the road. And I think we are going for a drink. And I don't know whether I'm going to change my love from cheetahs and say I love baby elephants more. I don't know because that baby was so cute crossing the road. And more of them are coming from the left. And they're heading towards Murumati liver drainage. I don't know if they're going for a drink. But how adorable is this to see some nice breathing hard. Just keeping my voice low to respect them as they come. You can hear them rumbling. We got two of them like that. Very good. And most likely they're going to cook for a drink somewhere as it's warm. And Craig was looking at some two about. 12 o'clock when you can once you finish with those. I'm not sure. Sorry, they're having a friendly. You see those two there? Having one drunk on each other. They do some greetings and knowing each other each other better. Two young bulls there. And we saw one very huge bull here that I have not seen for a long time. And it was missing one task. So this one have been like having their trunks, they could entangle their trunks, move each other backwards and forwards, more of a play fight than a fight. And there's one huge bull, I'm not sure the one walking away there, but one task is, I think it is, one task is missing, the right task is missing. And he's quite massive and I think very dominant. I wouldn't know what might have happened to this task, but sometimes they may lose them as they grow, you know, when they're bringing down trees or when they're involved in fights. Some of the fights are very fatal and they may end up, you know, moving it over and just losing it. Or genetically, there are those alleys that are born, you know, with one task. We'll be finding out. I'll just move forward a little bit and find out the direction they're taken and see whether I could see anything like a wound or a hole or like uh, notice how long that might have healed. So many things would happen, especially for the males. Females to rarely fight. We'll always see males being involved in little differences. And I'm just trying to drive slowly here because the breeding hard and He's walking away. So if you look in the foreground, he's walking away. I'm not sure why the females were not very comfortable with him there. I don't know if he wants to change his mind and come back, but he's walking away from the main herd. While the big group has gone to our right, and I'm not sure they're going for a drink or for a different type of foliage. And very quietly they just came and crossed the road and they are right inside the Murumwati River. As we find out if they're going to drink, Raf got some animals that are always in and around the water. Well, this is, uh, it's like hippo soup here. There's all sorts going on and there's a very big pod of them here and they all are quite active look at that it seems like there's quite a few youngsters as well so i think they're just being a bit boisterous having a bit of a play a bit of argy bargy and all sorts and it's always wonderful to watch hippos one of my favorite animals or one of the most iconic of the african bush especially that call along with the african fish eagle and elephants and lions and all of that but Hippos form a major part of of my feeling around the African bush. And there you can see an adult just getting in the mix, probably making sure that it doesn't get out of hand. And there is definitely a game going on here. You can see the adults just sitting around, checking up on the youngsters. So it won't be too long and um, they'll be heading out, going for a feed. But they're just enjoying the water for now. And why wouldn't you? They seem to have so much fun. 
They're the hippos. Some of them facing us. Some of them are very busy. Some just having a snooze. And the, the youngsters obviously got lots of energy making the adults tired as usual. <laughs> and they all go under and then every now and then they all pop up uh, while well, the uh, great egret is still just carrying on its um, mission. It hasn't caught anything yet, so you haven't missed anything. That adult looks quite sleepy. See how they look quite scratched on their backs? That's generally, you know, they can fight between each other, so they can get quite scratched from each other, and they can also get scratched from the thorns and bushes that they walk through at night to go and feed. Because they're also walking the paths that elephants and rhino and all the rest are walking. And we, we often forget that they actually do come out at night and they frequent all these uh, grassy areas that uh, a lot of the other animals do too. And so those scratches are, I would say, mostly from, from thorn bushes. See that? Lots of them. Walk through all sorts. Now, Lily, who is seven years old, thank you for your question. Yes, hippos can see underwater, and they've got a little lens that goes over the eye that actually protects the eye when they go underwater. So sometimes they close their eyes if they want to sleep, but they can open their eyes and see, and they've got a little extra eyelid that comes down, and, uh, and then it helps them see. It's almost like putting goggles on. When you go underwater and you put goggles on, you can see very clearly, can't you? And, uh, well, the hippos have got built-in goggles, they put that nictitating membrane, which is a difficult word, but we'll just say it's an extra lens that they put over their eye when they go underwater, and then they can see very clearly. So they can do whatever they like underwater, as long as they hold their breath. They can chase each other around, but um, the water isn't always very clear. So they, don't, they aren't able to see too far, because um, there's a lot of uh, browny color in the water. So... It's not as clear as you would think. They can maybe only see about a meter if you're lucky. And sometimes when they come up out of the water, you can actually see that little lens that is still there before it goes back. That's a big hippo, that. A very big adult. Much bigger head than the younger ones. Uh, Joan, uh, hippos will give birth in the water and they also suckle in the water. Um, but um, as far as I know, when they do give birth, they go sort of in the shallows. And because obviously once the, the little baby is born, it would need to uh, be easy for it to, to breathe air because it is a air breathing mammal. Um, and it needs to quite quickly, obviously, take uh, oxygen in. It's quite similar to that of whales, where whales, you know, when they're born as well, and dolphins, etc., um, they also need to very quickly be able to get up to the surface and take a breath. And, um, well, hippos aren't as good swimmers as whales and dolphins, so the little baby needs to be able to just push up off the ground and be able to get take a breath. Otherwise, it could drown. But yes, they definitely do give birth in the water and they also suckle in the water. So the little baby will go and drink from its mom, but it has to hold its breath. And so it's quite, um, quite a feat to be able to do that. But she generally would then separate herself a little bit from the, uh, the herd or the pod of hippos and uh, she will give birth a little bit away from them and then uh, sometimes stay on her own, like a lot of mammals would do. Stay on her own for a while with a little baby, even for a few days. Yeah. And uh, in, so, in such way, the, the mom and the baby, they form that little relationship. Um, it's quite similar to that of humans, you know. Um, when, when people have babies, they do sort of have that little bit of a period alone with their baby. And um, it's only after a few days that that, uh, you know, it's, um, allow everybody to come and see the little baby. and uh, But it's very important to have that alone time. 
And look at this one. It looks like he's fallen asleep on top of the adult. Or maybe he's just do climbing on top as to cause nonsense. Look at that. It looks like he's causing nonsense, eh? I would say so. It looks like my little boy, when I can see he's going to cause nonsense, I can actually predict it. I know when he's going to be up to no good. But normally, um, with no harm intended, just good fun. <laughs> Very cute. But at the same time, having a little snooze. Ooh! Sounds like Taylor has found some very interesting little clues. Let's go on over to her and see what they are. Finally, Ralph, we have indeed, after, well, marching through most of Juma, we have a leopard track that you can see, and they are very, very fresh. A little bit of disturbance, but it has been quite a windy afternoon, but definitely on top of the tire tracks from this morning safari. So a male leopard has been moving around here. Now, the tracks are coming from Shibamu Savage's track junction going onto Philemon's cut line. And this is exactly where uh, Rexon said that he think Hukumori had come onto the property. So perhaps he was just resting around here. There's some nice spots, but uh, just at the back of the pad here, the sand is still very, very nice. And you can see the tracks. There's the first one, or well, one of them, and then they walk. They carry on all the way down the road so we're hopefully i've just i'm taking a rest now i'm exhausted this afternoon so thought i'd sit down so um basically we're going to try and follow those tracks rexon is on them and hopefully they'll lead us to exactly where we need to go we think that they're going to go off on an animal pathway into this drainage system which goes towards rebecca's road and perhaps he's going to pop out he could pop out anywhere i mean he could either either go to the big open plains near camp quarantine he seems to like that area uh, around Gallego too he could also go to ingwe alley and uh, maybe make his way towards Vuyotela Dam. So we're going to try and, uh, well, hopefully the sun will slow down and not go down too quickly tonight, and then we'll be able to find him. Maybe Hukumori will do what he did last night and give a rasping call that will pin pinpoint us in his direction. We've got David on the property too, so if we do need any help in the vehicle, he'll come racing on back, and hopefully together we'll be able to produce another leopard. One that's a little bit better to see. I better just sort this out very quickly very nice very very nice tracks I'm just looking at them all walking here look here straight over the tire tracks from this morning here you can actually see this is one of the the safari live vehicles this tread over here and this is straight over the top so whether it was steve or whether it was david driving here i'm not so sure but we know that a leopard has been here very cool. So exciting. You can see Rexon making circles on the sand also. Just marking them. Now, I know that David Nice. You sure wish you could have seen Senzel there for a second. He almost did a slide, but then he did a little hop on one foot and jump back on. Senzel's a very good dancer. It was very impressive, that move. So with the backpack and the camera, he's still able to boogie. Come on, do a moonwalk for us while you're on the camera. I'll do one with you. Right, we're going to moonwalk our way, trying to find this leopard. David is doing the same. Oh, you can hear it, eh? Yes, I can tell you, we are very lucky to have some of the best cameramen uh, in this part of Africa, and they do some great job. We are now cruising on the Muruati River, and we are just seeing a little Nyala mill to the left there. And looking for the tracks that we had before of Tingana, we haven't seen them yet. And just hoping we'll see some tracks. Or as night has cooled off, he should wake up and start moving wherever he's hiding. And I'm sure he's somewhere. He's somewhere, somewhere. Nyala moving there with his characteristic uh, yellow socks. Hiding a little bit. And as the dry or as the dry season is coming and we get most of the grass drying up, we'll be seeing now Nyalas, you know, not doing a lot of leaves because the browsers will be getting so many herbs and plants from the ground. And in the meantime, let's go to Ruff, who is a bad.
Well, it's a birding extravaganza, like I said earlier. Look at this. We found an African spoonbill all on his own. And wow, it's a one-legged African spoonbill. No, not really. It's just uh, got the one uh, coiled up there as um, some of these long-legged birds do, just resting the one leg. And Kirsten in FC, she said that um, when she was young, she used to be obsessed with these spoon balls. I wonder why. Because when we were young, sometimes we used to get beaten with a, a wooden spoon. Well, I did anyway. So, but uh, they, they're wonderful birds in the way that they feed. Uh, Kirsten says she never was. She was an angel. Well, I definitely wasn't. So maybe that's why I got in trouble. Lots of it. But um, these spoon bills, they sort of waft their bill from side to side, quite similar to that of the yellow-billed stork that you might find in areas around here, as well as up in the Maasai Mara. And uh, so they, they sway it from side to side, and anything that uh, touches the the bill, they'll then snap it up from tadpoles to frogs to fish to shrimps to freshwater prawns and all sorts. This one seems to be taking a little bit of a snooze, or is it doing some preening as well? A wonderful afternoon. And I did see some other animals starting to make their way down to the water. Oh, we've got a big elephant here. He's just shifting the the uh, water buck along. What's your problem, Mr. Elephant? You'll see here, sorry, we're just shifting off from that spoon bowl because we've got an approaching big animal here that seems to be a little bit funny in his mood. What's your problem, buddy? See that head raised with the ears out, trying to make himself look bigger? Well, that's a young bull that's maybe a little bit unsure of himself. So he's just trying to now... Oh, what's he keep looking at? I wonder. He spotted something a little bit further up there. Uh, sorry for the aerial that might come into frame. You see how he also goes behind the tree um, because he was just trying to sneak up on us. But uh, you're not going to sneak up on us, buddy. You're a little bit big for that. I'm sorry, now he's going right behind the vehicle with the aerial there as well. That's it. And he's going to probably come down for a drink. He's probably just trying to throw his weight around, but he's a, you know, a, a teenager. So he's, you know, you can very quickly see that they're not sure of themselves walking with the head held high and the ears out and trying to shift all the other animals away. But anyway, looks like the spoon bull's non-plussed. He's just gone back to sleep. I haven't seen um, Vladimir the crocodile anywhere. Magic dragon wizard, they go like that with one leg up because, um, well, they can balance quite well with just one leg. And uh, it seems like, you know, they're just resting the other leg. So they're not being active at this particular time. And you'll see there he's actually tucking his head in as well. Um, and so he's actually having a bit of a snooze. So it's a really relaxed pose once they get the one leg up. Um, and can balance extremely well. It's uh, quite a feat. And so a lot of these tall birds with, with the very long legs, you often see them doing that. I don't know if they get tired with both their legs down, and sometimes they swap them. But uh, this one, all on his own, and um, African spoonbills are uh, residents. We, we see them all over Southern Africa. And... Um, they are, when they're not in breeding times, they are quite nomadic as well. So it's not quite, it's not unusual to find one on his own like this. They move around and go to different water points and so on all over the place. So you can quite regularly find just the odd individual coming in, popping in for a, a bit of a feed and a bit of a relax. And then they move off. He might come here tomorrow and he's gone. And then you come back in a week and he's back. Or a different one is here. You know, so there's all. Oh, we've got a water buck just in front of us having a drink there as well. Next to the blacksmith lapwings. It's a beautiful light now as we start heading into that golden couple of hours just before sunset, well, around sunset. 
can see her. She's quite thirsty. She's been drinking for quite a while now. Just the constant wagging of the tail on that uh, toilet seat bottom, keeping the flies away. But she's, uh, see that? And also it's just shifting the legs as well. They get quite irritating. And there are some biting flies around as well. But you can watch the water going right up her throat, past her gullet, and up it goes. And she might uh, only drink tomorrow morning again. So she's going to really make sure she gets enough in. And then she can disappear into the bush, having quenched her thirst. She is a very good looking waterbuck, I must say. And it's about that time for drinks and sundowners. So she's hit it right at the perfect time. Come and have a drink and then, uh, you know, they can also be quite vulnerable if they come down for a drink at night because often, you know, I used to watch the lions in uh, different national parks and they often come down to the waterhole at night and lay in ambush waiting for animals to come for a drink. You can see when they are drinking as well, they're a lot more alert. You see the little birds just walking around there, the Cape turtle dove. Very relaxing. Yeah, next to the water hole, but also lots going on. There's all sorts happening. Sometimes nice just to sit next to a water hole like this, especially with this much activity, and there's just so much happening that you almost don't know where to look. Look at those blacksmith lapwings just moving in around her as well. They're also monogamous. You see, they walk along, and then every now and then they just grab at something. Also quite long legs, and the, the lap wings like that, you can often find them also standing just on one leg. And it seems to be a common denominator with birds with longish legs relative to their body. And they seem to enjoy standing on one leg. And the spoonbill's still on his one leg. So he hasn't moved at all. Oh, looks like they're just jumping around the water buck. And look at that. See? Gemma, yes, I'm going to just pull up the African spoonbill here, and they are in the actual same family as the flamingos. So I'm going to grab my little book and I will show you why we're watching it. Spoonbill. There we go. Right. It's the family Platalidae. The ibises and the spoonbills, and they just, they're just near to the, uh, very close to the, um, so that, no, they're not in fact in the same family, but they are very closely related. Uh, just have a look there. Sorry about the light. Let me maybe get it into there. How's that, Ferg? Um, so very much on the same page in the book, um, but just slightly, they're probably like cousins, if I could say that. The flamingos are the family Phenicopteridae, <laughs> and, this, and the spoonbills are family Platylidae. Now, strawhead, um, the spoonbill could potentially also turn pink like the um, flamingos if they had to eat those particular kind of freshwater shrimps um, and and also the algae that uh, the flamingos feed on. Now, because if you get flamingos like in a zoo, they don't turn pink if they're not eating those particular uh, colored uh, food. And so very often in the, in the zoos or in uh, where, where you might have them, they, they feed them, what is it? I think it's radish or something. It's got a very pink color to it. Uh, what's the other one? What's the other uh, vegetable that's very pink? Beetroot. Um, beetroot. Thanks, Ferg. Beetroot. They actually feed them beetroot, which helps them then get that pink color. So it's all down to the, um, what they feed on. It's not naturally occurring like that. And that actually then makes them get the pink color. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that if a spoonbill had to eat similar food to flamingos, which they don't really, um, they would also get a very pink color to them. And they've already got very pink legs and a very pink bill and a very pink face. But I think that their feathers might also get a pink tinge to them if they had to eat beetroot or if they had to eat any of that algae and shrimps, etc.
Now, Tracy, good question. How do the spoonbill feed their chicks? Well, they open their bill, and, uh, you know, it's like a lot of their uh, birds. Um, they would be regurgitating food to their chicks, and they're opening it to the side. And... Uh, <laughs> do they spoon feed them? Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's uh, it, it would be perfect if they had to do that. But uh, that spoon is not really like uh, like a classic spoon. Uh, they scoop it, uh, you know, from the top. Um, they would be opening their bill and sort of uh, chattering it. So opening and closing very fast. And the chick would then come from the side and sort of get that regurgitation as it comes through. Um, so in effect, um, spoon feeding them, but in a, in a bird-like way and in a spoon bill way. But, yeah. Very, very odd shaped bull is the spoon bull, and a very unmistakable. You can't mistake a spoon bull for anything else um, because there's nothing that looks anything like them. The open bull stalk has got a, a similar bull. Oh, there you go, there's a little pied kingfisher. Well spotted, Ferg. That, has he got something? Yes, he has. Well done. Jeez, like. See my expert cameraman here. That was very well done. Oh, I'll just be left to see if that's a male or a female. Looks like it was a male. You see by those little bands on the front of its chest. Flying. Oh, there he's hovering. One of the true hoverers, hey? Is a pied kingfisher. There he goes. Okay. Yeah, missed him. Missed him. Well, you got the first time. Well done. It's like, so you see what I mean? There is so much happening here. It looks like the spoon bowl is just uh, like the peanut gallery, just watching from the side. Probably saying that second one was a rubbish attempt, mate. He has a bit of, you see how he wipes his head? That's also, once again, act, uh, you know, actively utilizing that preen gland, which is pretty much on their back, right in the middle. And now he just puts his bill under his wing it's all quite similar to the way the giraffes sleep, actually. They also do that, put their head on the rump. On one leg. Well, not on one leg, but <laughs> for sake, on one leg. They they sort of um, lie down on their haunches and then put their, their head on their, on their rump with a terribly long neck. Must give them a sore neck in the morning. Anyway, that is very interesting. CNAC, um, these African spoonbills, they nest quite similar to the herons, um, and it's um, up in the trees. They do need to get a little bit away from the, the ground, so they do nest up in the trees with just a very messy type nest, like what we've got up here in this, uh, it looks like a knob thorn, or maybe it's a leadwood, I'm not quite sure, it looks like it's degrading a little bit like a knob thorn, but quite messy like that, and oh, that's obviously your red bull buffalo weavers, but uh, a spoon bull and the herons, they could utilize the top of that as well. They bring in some old pieces of reed and even some a little bit of mud sometimes, and they'll then uh, stick it on top there, and they'll nest on there. Quite similar to that of the herons as well. When you've ever seen a goliath heron, they look very ungainly when they go on top there and it's, it's almost like they're going to fall out of the nest because it's very uh, untidy, uh, quite similar to that with these uh, ox peckers and red bull buffalo weavers. They often use those nests just to throw quite a bit of stuff on top of it and then make their nest there. So quite similar to that. Anyway, I think uh, we're going to start to make our way a little bit away. Ooh, oh, no, let's have a look at this African fish eagle. Now look at that. Well spotted, Ferg. Ferg is my bird spotting machine in the background here. That is very, very pretty. And these guys are resident here too. So... Well, I think in a little bit I'm going to start up and head back and see if Tandi and Tlalamba are getting active. And so I think our time here by the waterhole is now coming to an end, but what a time it has been. And uh, while I start up and head that way, I think I'm going to head you back over to... Oh, no, let's hang on here. Is he going to catch something? Oh, my word. He got it. And I was just about to start up. I can't believe it. He's obviously, I think it's a little tilapia that he's got. 
Now let's see if we can see it actually picking it away. You see he's got it in his talons there. There we go. We didn't see the heron make a kill, but we've just watched the fish eagle catch a fish. That's awesome. It's a very small fish, but it's a fish. Just like Ferg, you're really getting the fishing birds going out. Yeah, I feel like I'm fishing myself. <laughs> Ferg's gonna go fishing himself. And look, he's still struggling. I think he could swallow that old fish down. And they've got quite a lot of spines on them, so they do need to swallow them head first. Ferg's also a fisherman. He likes his fly fishing, ties a bit of flies as well. They cleaning his bill. And that was a little snack. A bit of bar snacks, eh? Mm. Evening. <laughs> Evening snacks. Evening snacks. Well done. Well done to Ferg. Well done to the fish eagle. What a spot. That was awesome. Okay, <laughs> so now I was just about to send you on over to Taylor when, we, when Ferg spotted that fish eagle. And so I'm going to do that right now. So exciting. I don't know if you managed to actually see the fish eagle catching that line. That's incredible. Remember, I sat for ages waiting for that fish eagle to try and swoop on down. Now, I'm trying to not be too loud. There's an ox pecker that just flew overhead because watch your thorns. Okamori turned off the road. He came all the way up here on Rebecca's road. And then he followed a major game path, which uh, we're following at the moment. We think he probably would have settled down for the day. But now we're trying to find him here, so I don't want to talk too loudly. I have absolutely no idea what Hukumori is like on foot. I've never walked into him before. Sometimes he looks like he wants to eat you, even when you're in the car. I'm just joking. I don't think we're going to have to worry, anything to worry about. Nine times out of ten, the big cats are petrified of us on foot, and they get up and they run. It's just if you corner them and you block them, they've got nowhere else to go that you could find yourself in a bit of a tricky situation. So, we're talking softly, we're walking slowly. I think he could probably be down in this drainage system, maybe just resting up. It's getting to that time where he probably will get up and start moving around. Now, Hukumori has a bit of a trend. He likes to rock up on Zoe's road and this drainage line actually takes you right there. So I wonder if all this time this, this isn't the pathway that he's maybe been using to sort of sneak through the property because he does do that. His tracks will just disappear and it's often around in this area. It would make a lot of sense that he would utilize. This would be a quicker way and also there'd be potential things for him to find. Watch your step there, Senzo. Very, very cool though. Having a little look around. I actually want to look at look in the strange one. Let's have a quick look how big it is. Wow. I actually don't think I've ever been down in here at this side. I've crossed through it once or twice before, a little bit further up. But it's actually really, really big. And you can see how it's opening up now. You can also see why you'd see lots of buffalo down in here. Look at all the grass that hasn't been touched. So they would love to feed in here. So during the winter times, you must be careful. Also, herds of elephants will feed down in here. It'll be nice and cool. I don't know how much water the elephants will be able to dig here. I don't think this is a very, very good uh, place for, for, for water. Very exciting. We have indeed seen lots and lots of elephants around here. I didn't realize how big it extended in some of these areas. Now, I'm very excited. I have a good feeling. I think we're going to find Okamori. I really do. Whoever was walking here, maybe it was Tingana. But while we try and sneak around the edge of the drainage line, I don't know who I'm going to send you to. Well, it's me, David, here, and uh, signs of uh, trucks of Hukumori could be good news, and uh, we have what uh, also helps us to truck leopards that uh, when they make alarm calls, they always help us, and those are the grey go away birds. I say that they go away, as their name suggests, and as they go away, we are also going away, and maybe try to go close to where the bush uh, Oak team is and maybe that might help us or we might go to help them when they see the trucks we are able to penetrate in the bush and make the life easier 
Well, we are, it has been quiet. All the trucks we followed did not lead us to anywhere very important or anywhere we could see a leopard. So we decided to take a different route. And sometimes is when you like forget and think, well, let me just do something different and good things happen. So we've taken a totally different route now from what we thought could be leading us to the Tingana leopard that was seen this morning. Nobody have seen it so far and you've got everybody looking out for him. So if it's Hukumuri that uh, Taylor are following, that will be good news. In my village a long time ago, we used to make jokes that you could walk in the forest like this. And if it's so quiet, you don't see anybody, you could go and just decide to shout greetings to the forest and you would go hello in the local language. And then because the thickets of the trees were so dense, you'd of course pick the echo and then you would also hear hello and you'd say, I am here. You could also hear, I am here. And then you could ask where exactly and then you could hear the echo similar to that where exactly. Of course, we knew it was not real. It was you talking to yourself, but the times could say, talk the trees and the trees will talk to you. So it's time now I'm thinking I should stop and say I'm here. I like Hoya, here, I hear here, Tingana, I'm here, and then I hear Tingana, I'm here. So let's see, I'm just debating at what point I am going to do that. It reminded me of way back in my little village. Hmm. Yes, yes, it is. Kasi says it's funny. You imagine when it's so quiet, you're not sure uh, whether everything is okay in the world and things are wrong, and you're like, is anybody living? Or I'm the only one who could be alive in the world, but you could pick the echoes from the forest, and you definitely knew there were echoes, but it give you the spirit of knowing, you know, you're not alone. So at one point, I might be doing that today. If Tingana doesn't physically show up, I might try that new trick and see whether it will be any fruit. Tesla, how are you? And you're asking, what is my favorite bird? Unless you have read my mind and you knew my answer, it is the same bird. So there's a fly trying to attack me on the eye. Tesla, I also love the lilac breasted roller. It is my favorite bird. And interesting because it's also the national bird of Kenya and also the national bird of Botswana. So yes, Tesla, I'm happy you love the bird I love. So we have a commonality there like a breasted roller. Isn't that wonderful? Tesla, tell me, do you have any particular animal that you could love? I mean, of all the animals we've been showing you here in Africa, do you have any that you'd love? Just think of one, and I'm sure you have one in your heart, and send your answer through. I'll be happy to know. I'll tell you mine in advance. Hopefully you don't share this. Mine is the elephant, which is yours. Let me know. All right, I might be starting my thing of like, hello. And listen, I'm here, but I need bigger, thicker trees than what I'm seeing here. Trees could be only like five meters away from where I am. And that will work perfectly. And I'd go, Tingana, where are you? And I would hear the same thing. I don't know how that will sound. Or should a leopard or lion hear me? I do not know how they would respond to that. But again, you never know. We are trained not to shout, you know, in the wilderness because definitely that's what I would call noise pollution and it would affect the animals. Ideally, should you shout, if an animal is not very far from you, you would make it to get your attention and maybe stand up and that's not the right way to do it. So just keep driving and keep crossing your fingers, you keep using your eyes and listening and waiting for your luck. And that's what you're continuing to do. I was waiting to hear what was your favorite animal. As usual, eyes will be on the ground for any trucks. And when the sun is not very soft like here, you may not see much. And Ruff is still having some good fun. Well, we are just watching that sun slowly heading down towards the horizon. It's not going to be long and it is going to be dipping past 
the horizon, making for a very beautiful sunset. There is not a cloud in the sky. And, well, I've decided to come back to this tree, which if any of you know anything about trees, that's an African weeping wattle with those very characteristic compound leaves. And underneath it, we've got the very beautiful Tundi leopard, who was a minute ago feeding on the carcass. She's still very deep inside there now. She's doing a little bit of grooming. And it seems like little Tlalamba was trying her luck at a bit of hunting. She was trying to stalk a little steenbok. I don't think she was successful, but she's not far from us. And there we go. Tundi's now picking up a bit of the meat from that young bushbuck that she has killed. It looked like she was lying right on top of it. There she goes. Starts picking it up a bit. She's doing a little bit of contact calling. Seems like she may be calling the little cub now. So if we're patient here, we might see it coming towards us because I'm sure even that little call that she did would have been heard. But yep, here she comes. There she is. She's going to make her way just in front of us now. I'm going to keep my head out of the way. And there she is. She's, it looks like she's dragging it out a little bit. And a little Tlalamba has responded to Mommy's little contact call. She went off to go try her luck at hunting. And now, in true leopard cub fashion, she's making her way nice and slowly through the thickets, a little bit out into the open, but very quiet. See the fat belly, hey? Hello, little one. Thank you for showing yourself. Beautiful. So it looks like it was a good move to come back and have a look here. And mommy's calling her now. So I'm just going to keep quiet because she's moving just in front of the vehicle. And I don't want to scare her. And mommy is still doing little contact calls. Calling her, maybe saying, come on. and run off with it. She's gaining in confidence, I must say. She's literally gone against Mommy's will there, and she's stolen the meat for herself. Good on you, Tlalamba. Look at that. Already carrying that front section of that bush puck, and she's made off with it, leaving Tandy to now follow. <laughs> that was classic. I think there must be still a bit more meat there because now Tandy looks like she's dragging some other meat. But little Tlalamba obviously said, No, Mom, I'm not listening to you this time. I'm taking the meat and I'm going to have my share. Sorry for you. And Tandy did look a little bit like she had been told off herself. <laughs> Some other guys just coming past us. It looks like they've gone across. They went other side. And I think I might just go around and have a look if we can see them. I think we go around the other side. I'll just wait for the other vehicle just to pass us around our back. No need to have two vehicles racing around. we will just be nice and quiet. And we'll wait for them just to move. It looks like they might have gone in a little bit more of an exposed position that we can see them. So Tlalamba's done us a favor because she's grabbed that meat and gone out a little bit where we can see them nicely, not so deep inside this uh, weeping wattle. So I'm just going to now start up. See how the vehicle is making its way there. Let's just go around on this side, keeping our distance as well, so that uh, they can comfortably carry on with their business. Let's just 
move round on this side. How exciting was that? Shalamba really asserting herself, eh? Because she got a proper smack in the face. Now, love three dogs, I agree with you. I, I really do like her character. She's, um, she's like a little spitfire, absolutely. And she needs to start becoming like that because uh, it won't be too long and she's going to have to go on off on her own. So uh, she needs to get a bit of attitude. And I'm just going to pull forward here. We do have some other people watching with us. So we can all not be staring straight at each other. And once again, this is a two-vehicle sighting. I didn't see where Tlalamba is. Yeah. There we go, Tandy doing a bit of grooming. Quite sheepishly, obviously she got told off by Salamba. And I'll just watch her for a little bit and then we'll see if we can spot Salamba. I think she might be feeding on that bit of meat that she stole from Mum. But very nice that they've um they've been able to get themselves a lovely meal. Well done, Tandy. And at the same time letting little Salamba also practice a bit of her hunting as she tried her luck with a little steenbok unsuccessfully but that's uh, all part of the learning process and learning how to steal meat from other cats even if it is your mum that's uh, leopards can be quite skillful at stealing meat from other cats even if it's another leopard even if it's part of your own family you need to do what you need to do in order to survive. So I'm actually, there's not a problem with that, having stolen the meat from mum. She's also got a fat belly. So it's all good. Every now and then when she pushes down on those feet of hers, a little bit of a claw gets exposed. It's starting to cool down nicely now, so always better for activity of predators. Shame we've got that grass in front, but I can't complain. We're sitting with this beautiful cat and her little cub. Wonderful. Yeah, I agree with all of you that are commenting how feisty the little cub is. She's going to need that going forward. She needs to be feisty, kind of like Shadulu. You see how feisty she is and holding her in very good stead. And a good future ahead of her if she carries on like that. She needs to fight for her survival. Being a solitary cat, as she will be sooner or later, she's going to have to assert herself. So she started young. It's a good, feisty character. I like it. Now, Ivy, um, I'm not exactly sure on how long uh, precisely leopards can remember, but um, I, I think they've got a half-decent memory because they can remember smells and they can remember also when they've had conflict um, because it's quite evident in the way that they react to those smells when they come up uh, you know across them again you know, even if it's you know a year or two apart if they've had a big conflict with a particular animal uh, or you know or another cat and then they come into that area and, um, and then they will definitely react almost in the same way in getting out of the area so in a minute i'm going to just try and see if we can spot Tlalamba feeding on this carcass but uh, while i do that off to taylor seems she's got a lovely kudu we have and we've got the best kind of kudu when they're up on a termite mound silhouetted with a well a fading fading orange of the sky how cool is that now the reason why she's standing up there is because she's in fact watching us there's an entire herd here there was a big male there's a couple of sub-adults and then a few kudu cows too 
but she's just keeping a close eye on us. The grass is quite tall here. It's densely packed with trees, so we are concealed quite a bit, and she doesn't want that. She wants to be able to see us all the time. Now she looks like she's settling down slightly. She's grooming herself at the moment, so that's quite nice. She can't be too terrified of us. Obviously, we're just at the perfect distance away for her. She can see us. We're not trying to hide away. I'm not really lowering my voice at all. I want them to know that we're here and we're not trying to hunt them. But maybe they know something else. Maybe they've already heard the rasping sounds of a leopard or smelt the scent of one. So perhaps they are a little bit on the nervy side. We think that this is the area where Hukumori could be. But there's quite a few of them. I wish another one would actually go up onto that termite mount. There she goes. Off she goes. We've been fairly lucky. Yesterday afternoon we had an amazing bushwalk where David actually got the most beautiful shot again, featuring a termite mound and, and the sunset with all those birds feeding in the golden glow. Wasn't that absolutely beautiful? I really wish we could get an open, closer view of these kudu, but I think that they are just going to dash away from us. Let's see. At one point, they all came out into the open. They were just staring at us with their big ears like this. It was so pretty. It was very, very pretty. But they didn't stay like that for very long. They've been bouncing back and forth. It's amazing. Now, because it's starting to get a little bit darker, we're not going to be walking in any very dense places. We're going to try and stick to sort of the more open areas now because the light is fading. There she is again, Senzo. You can just see through the... Just through the trees. And there's another one coming... They might all come out. And then just to the right, in about two steps, you should see another. There we go. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? They even have turned their backs on us now, so they can't be too bothered by us. That's awesome. Now, Ravinda, we've been seeing a lot of battles going on between the Impala, the Kudu, and also the Inyala. And you've asked if the Inyala actually do, the, uh, no, if the Kudu do a similar dance to the Inyala. I don't think they do. I've never ever seen it before. It's only really the Inyala that do that beautiful sort of slow, exaggerated movement where they size one another up. Uh, Kudu, well, they also posture slightly at one another, but in the end, they end up locking horns. Here we go. Is this what we're looking for, Rexon? That's awesome. Okay, so we've just picked up on these male leopard tracks again. I just happened to look down onto the ground. They must have just come out of here, though, because they haven't been on this road, and it's quite sandy. Very exciting stuff, so now I'm going to call David in and tell him to come and help us, because the sun is fading. Right, off you go to, well, another leopard who seems to be a lot more playful than this one. Yes, well, I haven't been able to uh, reposition because Tlalamba now is so close to the car that if I start up now, I might startle her. So I'm just waiting for her. She seems to be uh, almost getting ready to stalk Mom because Mom walked over to the same bush that she's just lying next to, a nice round-leafed bloodwood or round-leafed teak. And uh, she's just on the opposite side, and she was waiting for Mom to come around, and then she was going to pounce, I think, in a very playful mood. But Mom uh, stopped that by just plopping over. So, Salamba's game is up. She'll have to stalk Mom from around the outside. And she's still got her little prize of the head of the, the young bushbuck. So that's how close they are to us, and that's why I say, if I start the vehicle now, I might startle this little youngster. So I'm not going to do it just yet. I'll give her a chance just to move around, and then I'll see if I can get us a better view. It's not ideal, but, uh, well, we're still in their presence, and wonderful. And she's playing the patience game. She still thinks Mom's going to come around the corner there, I think. But uh, as youngsters do, eventually their patience runs out first. She is a pretty cat. And quite feisty, after we've just learnt. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, 
Now, Mina Mu, um, generally these two wouldn't be hunting together just yet. Um, well, and they generally don't hunt together at all. And what will happen is, um, so Tandi will go off and hunt and normally leave Tlalamba on her own. She'll go off and hunt. Um, and then once she's killed something, she'll either return and go and fetch her, or it depends on how far away that she actually left Tlalamba. Sometimes uh, if she's in with within earshot, she could maybe just give her the contact call um, and she will then come and find mum. But uh, normally she would have to move a little bit away. And my feeling is in this particular scenario, um, mom made this kill. She went and stashed it inside that, uh, that weeping wattle bush. And then uh, she went off and called for little Tlalamba and she then came running to mom and then she led her in here to this particular area. So that's the that's my feeling as to what's happened and that's generally what does happen as they get a little bit older and they might start going with mom but at a moment it's almost like they do say to the cub okay stay there and then they go off and they stalk and catch prey and then from there they they're in where well, they're within earshot and then they call them in so that's generally what does transpire but uh, well, at least we know that they're both doing very well and uh, both got very fat bellies. Happiness is a leopard with a fat belly. That is wonderful. So I think now we've got our gap. I should be able to start up and go around the other side and we can maybe get a much better view on these on these cats because we're the only ones in here now so we can I just don't want to start off Tlalamba so I'll just start before I move okay so she's not plussed at all all right while I go and get us a better view let's go off to Rafiki Dave well Rafiki Dave is here and we managed to catch up I think with Ellie that left the main herd the big one that i thought did not have one tusk i just want to be sure it's this one here but i guess it's the one here it was missing one right tusk it must be this one here it's a big boy huge male not sure that he's in must or not but more often than not, if the females are very good, Craig, if the females are very, sometimes they don't get very comfortable with bulls in mass, and maybe she was, you know, he was shown the door, and she, they were like, "Get out of here!" So he only he only got one task. I'm confirming. So the same one we saw earlier, and was very playful with some of the young bulls. They look to be very good friends, but not anymore. And as usual. Male bulls will tend to live their own life sometimes as they get older. So we'll also lead our own life at the moment. We need to get close to quarantine and find out what could be happening. Texai, your favorite animal is a zebra. Thank you for answering me. Zebra, yes. Look at zebra. Look at the black stripes, the white stripes. Some going this way, some going the other way. Excellent. And I think it's a beautiful animal too, so stick to zebra and I stick to the elephant. What do you think? So we've got totally different animals. One has stripes colors and the Ellie doesn't have any colors. Sounds good, eh? Alrighty, we're trying to catch up close to the bushwalk team and find out the trucks they may have seen if they ended up in a bar, some drainage area, if there could be of any help to them or to us. So let's go back. Let's go back in the meantime to Ralph, who have an actual leopard with him. Oh, look at that! We've managed to get our way around and have a perfect view in on Tlalamba and Mum. But uh, well, Tlalamba's got such a cute, um, sort of alert face about her. Beautiful. I wonder, I haven't, I haven't seen where her little stash is. Oh, no, there it is. It's just behind her. No. 
Ooh, Ferg saying that there's a leopard sawing not too far from us. Maybe that's why Tundi's got her ears bent back like she's quite irritated. That's not because of us. She's just done that now. I didn't hear that sawing because I've got a game drive vehicle radio in my ear, which I need to be listening to as well because uh, there might be other people wanting to come and see these two. And she looks quite concerned now that she did hear that, even though she seems like she's going off to sleep. Those ears tell a thousand words. And anybody that does have a little cat at home, you can watch them and they exhibit almost identical behavior to that of a, of a leopard and, and lions as well. Um, you can see them when they're irritated, how they swing their, their tail from side to side. They also put their ears back. And very often, just before they're about to pounce, you can see their tail going from side to side. And as it starts going up and down, that is an imminent pounce or an imminent charge. And we will also watch that uh, kind of body language when we're out walking on, on bush trails. You need to be very careful. You watch the cat's body language. And if a cat starts swinging its tail like that, you obviously would take a response towards just to try to diffuse it. And you can maybe just talk to the cat or, or try to back out or whatever. But, you know, you need to realize what the cat is about to do. It's quite similar with elephants. They often swing their leg um, from side to side. And if you see an elephant that's totally focused on you and he starts to swing his front foot uh, backwards and forwards, a charge is imminent. So those are the kind of little clues and body language signs that you need to watch. And as I was saying, with those ears just going a little bit back, that's a bit of irritation and probably listening to that sawing that Ferg heard almost to our north, back towards uh, Cheetah Cutline. Are we hearing a little pearl-spotted owlet calling now? Beautiful. It's that time of the evening, eh? And there's lots of birds making alarm calls here. I think it might be because of these cats. So the tweet, 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 tweet. They often do that for snakes and for predators. All these little birds trying to come and mob these cats and get rid of them. Salama, feeling a bit sleepy. You've got lots of food in your belly, so I wouldn't be surprised. You also went off on a little adventure on your own, trying to see if you could catch a steenbok. That's it. Practice makes perfect. So, I haven't actually worked out Tlalamba's spot pattern just yet. I think I saw four on her right side. Is it four or five? Not quite sure. Look very clear four, but there might be a another one that's just merging in there to make it five on the right hand side. Let's check the other side when I get a clear view on it again. Need to write it in on all my spot patterns. Ah. Thanks, James Richard. Um, you're saying that it, it seems to be a 5-5 five, five spot pattern. So that's uh, pretty much the same as her mom. And, um, well, sometimes, and as, as James Richard has said there, it seems to be coming through um, because sometimes you can have merged dots that look as one, and then as they grow, they start to sort of separate a little bit. And you can have slight changes in the coloration. So... But it seems like, as as you've said, that it's merging into or growing into a five five spot pattern. So same as same as her mum. No, what am I saying? Not five five. Mummy's three three. Um, Shadulu's five five. Um, Tandi is three three. So she's got now two more on either side than mum. It seems. Uh, yeah. Hey. Sorry, I was just chatting to, to Ferg. I don't know if 
something came through there, but um, oh, Ferg saying that there's a leopard swing again. I missed that. So my ears aren't, I'm listening to these birds. They're all super ears Ferg here in the back. But that's why we're a, we're a good team. And like he was spotting the birds earlier. And he's gone from fisherman, super fisherman, to super ears. Well, a super cameraman. Cameramen can be superheroes too, you know. Well, we've got two super cats, but they're super sleepy. <laughs> Kirsten's saying sometimes, I think that was about the cam camera operators. Well, we're all part of a super team, I would say. All got to fulfill our little roles, as these cats also need to do in the greater scheme of things. All right, and as Kirsten says, it's time to send you from a super sleepy cat to a super bushwalk team. Oh, that's so, 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 so sweet, hey? Oh, that members of our team are so loving. Now, this termite mound should look familiar because this is where I've hands down had the best squirrel sighting of my life. Remember, just the other morning... Not yes. Yeah, it was yesterday morning. We had a squirrel perched right up here, and it was just sort of sitting. Maybe I'll pretend to be the squirrel. <laughs> Kirsty says it's identical. Ha ha. Whatever. Anyways, um, <laughs> we, we hello. Uh, it's obviously getting dark now. We're still a little way from home. We're just walking. We're checking. We're listening to make sure that um, if Okamori is going to soar. We'll find him. Oh, Joan, I didn't ID that feather from yesterday because I lost it. And then I need to go and check the screenshots. But I did find some more feathers. Thank you so much for reminding me. Let me find the nice one. Cat Stamba. Look at this one. I don't think he'll get the answer to this. It's a tricky one. I've broken it. You'll have to just look at it like that. So that's one. I'm going to show you another one. I just need to take it out. It's very pretty white with sort of like a chestnut color on it. And then, it is a hard one, hey? I mean, here's actually a better one. We look at them like this. So there's one. And here's another one. That's a little bit better. Who can guess? Hashtag Safari Live. Or chat to us on the, the YouTube chat if you think you can tell us which bird this is from. It's a tricky one. I haven't chosen the most obvious feathers from this bird. I'll be very impressed if anybody gets it because it threw me off for a while. But then I found a few more. I think this bird must have been attacked by something that it lost quite a few feathers. <laughs> so, yes, this is going to be a tricky one. But I feel like you'll be up to the challenge. And then I'll try find, I'll go and watch the show again from from yesterday and uh, and get the the screenshots of that um, that feather because I can't find it. Oh Mary, <laughs> how did you get it so quickly? I really thought I had one here. You're quite correct. It is a Franklin. It is from a crested Franklin. I thought it was tricky because I didn't choose the obvious ones, but really pretty feathers. I don't think I've got very pretty fra crested Franklin feathers like that, so that shall be going to my feather collection. But um. Uh, yes, I, I will have a look for the other one. I, it's completely slipped my mind as well. And um, I'm sure someone's taken a screenshot too. So if you did take a screenshot of the feather from yesterday, please let me tag me. Now, Safari Kid, um, Maurice is in my camera box. He normally lives. Um, keeping my camera nice and safe not so that no one takes it. Um, I don't know if he got car sick. I haven't checked yet. That might be a nasty surprise when I when I open my camera box. Can you Maurice is my stuffed elephant, by the way. <laughs> I can't believe you all love him so much. I'm glad. I love Maurice. I think he's fantastic. I am going to have to wash him. I think I'm going to have to do an entire story of the washing process of Maurice. It could be quite funny. Can you imagine seeing him go round and round in the washing machine? Help! I wonder how long an elephant can hold its breath for. It'd have to be a quick spin cycle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm being ridiculous and I'm also making sense or walk really fast. 
No one else is laughing except me. That's what matters, I'll have you know. As long as I think I'm funny and I laugh at my own jokes, then I don't need anyone else. I'll just entertain myself for as well. It's going to be a very lonely life then. <laughs> Ah, now somebody who's got a better sense of humor than I do is the man that's just driving around the corner over there. And that's me because I am going to show you the moon now. How does that sound? Is that good sense of humor? Better than Taylor? He will show you the moon? Such a clear blue sky which was early in the morning very gray and overcast now it's looking different is that beautiful Castell? yes that's a beautiful moon and i think that's gonna bring a bit of humor in our hearts having a quiet afternoon and you might if you could talk to the moon and relate with it and find out what ideas it could give us to get hold of this hiding Tingana or Hukumuri with all the signs that have been seen of these two cats but at the moment then they cannot be seen themselves actually physically but definitely they are somewhere and I'm thinking we'll soon by the water pan uh, of Watella Dam and find out every evening either one of them has been found there so we just want to chance after having a long day or a short day whatever they, however they spend their day they might go there for a drink and I got a feeling we might be lucky so let's head that way and find out if any one of them would be going there for a drink Oh, you're saying it looks cold. Whatever, the, I think the temperatures have dropped a little bit. You said it looks cold. And yes, you have seen I've put on one more layer, just making sure. Yeah. All right. And uh, I don't know where you come from, Oren. In, at the moment here, we're doing 75 degrees Fahrenheit and 24 degrees Celsius. And 24 is a bit chilly for me. We started about 29 there. And 24 now is a whole difference of 5 degrees shh, down. 79, you know, is a big drop. So I do not know from 79 to 75 what could be your temperature where you are. And that's why I have added my one last layer just to make sure I keep warm. What I found out in the bush here, you do not wait until you get cold to put on an extra layer. So what you do... Once you see the cold coming, I don't know how true or how that works. Once you see the cold coming, no. Once you start feeling it coming, you immediately put on one layer or put up your layer. That makes you, whenever time is going to be cold, you'll be very covered. If you wait until it's so cold and you put on a warmer or some kind of jumper, it doesn't help very much. It takes quite some time to warm up. Give me an idea how you are, what temperature it is now. As you're heading out to those two water ponds and find out if any of those two male leopards will come for a drink. And I'm thinking of either Tingana or Hukumuri. Their presence have been felt and seen many times have been felt in the evening when we hear them sewing. And let's go to Ruff and find out what he got at the moment. Well, we haven't moved and neither have the cats. Well, mommy's actually just looking around a little bit. Um, uh, Tlalamba has gone completely flat now. Um, Tandy just keeps looking around. And Ferg keeps hearing this um, leopard sawing off. It might be near to Twin Dam's area. I'm wondering, Kirsten, would you be able to pass on a message to David if he's around in that area? Maybe you should just go and have a look. That might be Tingana calling in the Twin Dams area, unless he's uh, on the other side of the reserve. But um, well, we are just relaxing here with Tandi and Tlalamba. And uh, Tlalamba still got a little prize of the little bushbuck head 
but uh, not feeding on it at the moment. And Tundi just keeps looking over her shoulder, just being nervous as a mother would be or should be. And I'm sure sooner or later we're going to see them get up and maybe eat some more, possibly even go for a drink. That's also on the cards. Oh, Mom's up. What's she worried about? She senses something. It can also be that time of the evening. You know, this this food is on the ground. And, uh, well, we know that hyenas have exceptional noses. And there's every opportunity that one could come running in here. Maybe she's picked up a bit of movement there that she's being a little bit wary of. And it could be as fast as anything that this hyena could run in. And these two would have to scatter for the trees, taking the meat or lose it to the pesky hyenas. So she's quite alert now. Well, Lauren, um, with leopards, it's not quite like um, with... Um, with cheetah, uh, which will bring uh, youngster, you know, food back, which is still alive. It's uh, it's it's not that great, uh, not very nice to watch because you really feel sorry for the prey. But with cheetah, they need to do that extensively with their youngsters. They bring back um, live food that is injured, obviously, because the adult has caught it, and then they'll literally literally let, let it free for the the little youngsters, and then uh, then they play with it first and foremost, and then they start to tackle it a little bit, bite it. In, in, such, in so doing, they learn how to kill, and then eventually they also start chasing it slowly but surely, slowly but surely, and eventually then they go hunting with mum, and eventually they'll also then start to help mum to bring down prey. Now with leopards, they do that in a little bit, in a small way, but uh, they are almost natural hunters they they do learn on their own and leopards if um, even if Tlalamba had to be left right now she's got a reasonable chance of survival as long as she stays low key and she catches herself some lizards maybe moves on to uh, scrub hairs and then on to steenbok and later on to bigger things she I, I, you know I, I would put money on her surviving even from now if Tandia had to leave her completely or if she had to get into a fight with another leopard or get killed by hyenas or lions or anything like that, there's a very good chance that Tlalamba would survive. But with Cheetah, uh, it's uh, pretty much a death sentence if the, if the mother dies. And as well as rehabilitated Cheetah and these um, Cheetah that uh, are hand-reared, they need to be taught over an extensive period how to hunt. Whereas lions and leopards, I've been involved with both of them being hand-reared, for instance, or being uh, they were problem animals, as you know, and maybe the the adult was shot by a farmer, and then they you know they bring these cubs to rehabilitation centres and, and things like that, and then those cubs being re re released out into the wild um, without having learnt how to hunt, uh, we. I've monitored quite a few cats like this, lion and leopard, and um, they very quickly learn how to hunt on their own. It's, it's a crazy thing what hung, hunger does to these cats, both lion and leopard. Leopard being the more adaptable of the two, lions sometimes need a little bit of assistance in the way of, you know, their condition really drops very badly because they haven't caught anything and they, they haven't eaten in a long time. So sometimes you just need to give them a little bit of meat just to keep them going, um, but still leave that hunger as the real driving force. And then they start catching scrub hairs um, and move on to warthogs, um, even piglets, you know. And it's just actually them getting fit, getting strong enough and wanting it enough. And, uh, and then they generally start to hunt. And once they get the, the feel of it and they know that they can catch something themselves, they go from smaller prey to bigger prey in quite um, a relatively quick uh, space of time. So, 
<laughs> so these leopards, hopefully, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if a hyena does make an appearance that uh, Tandi would take this kill up a tree. But uh, speaking of being up a tree, I uh, wonder what's going on with Taylor. Hello, everybody. You're probably wondering how on earth I climbed up all this way because, uh, well, I'm quite high up in this tree. I'm pretending to be a leopard. Uh, if I think if I, I'd be um, a good version of Shidulu, however, I'm not going to run up and down these branches for you. But I saw this, and I saw the moon behind me, and I couldn't resist it. So we called David in, who was just down the way, to come and give me a hand. And I really hope a snake doesn't join me in this tree now, because then I'm going to leap down it. Also, if you want to hear something quite funny, I've managed to rip my pants in the process of climbing up this tree. <laughs> <laughs> which is hysterical. I don't understand how I did it because all I did was I sat on the tree and I slid down. Now, most of you know Marula Bark. Well, it's um, it's quite smooth. It's it's rough, but not, not like sandpaper. There's no thorns or anything. So apparently it was time for a new pair of shorts um, as I'll have to go be going into town soon um, to get some more. <laughs> <laughs> it was my favorite pair of shorts, too. I'm so sad that uh, these are going to have to be thrown away. So everyone's going to have to walk in front when we walk home, and I'll be walking home. <laughs> <than that. laughs> But yes, here we are. It's been a fun bushwalk, as you can imagine. Senzo's going to tell me when Kirsten says anything, because I don't actually have my radio. Wonderful. I don't have my radio. I thought I'd leave the expensive equipment down on the ground. Well, anyways, we've had fun out here. So from the entire Bushwalk team, thank you so much for watching. And uh, they'll be out, well, Bushwalk will be out again in the morning. I'm sure you want to see uh, the last couple of uh, views of Tlalamba before it gets too dark. Well, thanks, Taylor. Yep, and um, we'll see you back at camp. It's that time of the evening, getting a little bit dark now. And uh, not safe to be out if you're out on foot because uh, these predators are, are they're very different animals once it gets dark so it's always a safer option to be uh, in camp um, and i always say when that sun sets you've got yourself sort of you know 45 minutes or so um, and as soon as the sun sets you should always be making your way back home um, and uh, if anything pops up in between at least you've got yourself a little bit of time to to get through but um, and Tandi now looks like she is going to fall over the way that she's sleeping. It's like she's half sitting up and doing a very good job of keeping her head upright while she... Oh, there, maybe she, there we go. Uh, you can see as she opens her eyes sometimes, you can also see that nictitating membrane that cats also have. And, she, now, of course, because I've said it, she won't be opening her eyes any time soon. Judy, um, when hyenas come in, they come in, uh, probably, you know, they do try and get in a little bit quietly, but then they barge straight in, and they've got that very classic head-high bounding on their way in, and... Uh, you will see Tandi move from this position uh, to flying up a tree in a microsecond. She will very quickly know exactly what's going on. And you will see Tlalamba um, just disperse. She will probably bail straight for the closest tree and be going straight up it. Because if Aina gets hold of her, she's dead meat. So she also needs to react exactly like mom would. And if she has that grass rustling on the way towards her, she needs to move it. Otherwise, um, she could be as dead as that, uh, that little bush buck there. So she's done well up until now. And the one, it was a couple of weeks ago, I was actually sitting with them. Um, and they had a Steenbock kill. And um, Tandi kept on bringing it down onto the ground because Tlalamba wasn't very good at uh, feeding on it in the tree itself. She kept on taking the Steenbok out of the fork of the tree, holding it in her mouth, and putting her body in the fork of the tree and then hanging there. She looked quite awkward. Um, but then, it, you know, she was almost dropping the food all the time. And, um, well, everyone, it's just... 
getting to that time of the evening. You can see how grainy it's getting on the screen itself. We're losing light, so we're going to switch over to infrared. Um, oh, there we go. There we go. You see, so the infrared, that is our night vision. Now, I don't need to put any spotlight on them, and we can continue viewing in plain light like that. So... Klalamba was up that tree and she almost looked like she was dropping it all the time and so Tandi went over and took the meat down onto the ground and uh, there was obviously a hyena waiting for exactly that. It was just off in the periphery and so they both started feeding on the Stienbok and um, this hyena came bounding in and immediately Tandi grabbed that meat and went straight up the tree and Klalamba ran off um, to the closest uh, tree that she was near to um, and she went straight up into the fork of that and so they were both well off the ground and then the hyena just walked around a few times and then disappeared. Um, then later everything calmed down again, Tandi came down, she brought the meat down again for Tlalamba to feed on and of course the hyena just came running in and they did exactly the same again. So it was a little bit like Groundhog Day but it seemed like um, Tandi kept on taking it onto the ground so that Tlalamba could eat properly because she wasn't really feeding nicely up in the tree. So I think that's one skill that she does still need to learn um, unless she's learnt it in the interim because they do learn very fast. But uh, at that stage she's not, she was not very adept at uh, feeding up in the tree and so Tandi had to keep bringing it down but in so doing exposing themselves and attracting hyenas which is not ideal and um, at the moment it's the same story they've got this meat and it's on the ground but that uh, does expose them to hyenas and so well at least we know that Tlalamba is a good tree climber and she can get up there very fast so that's one thing in her favor I'm sure if there's any kind of danger she'll be straight up any tree in the near vicinity and there are lots of trees around lots of silver cluster leaves here that she could get up very quick um, and there's the odd marula as well so there's all sorts there's uh, plenty of uh, escape routes but um, well, for now, very flat cats. I'm just hoping that we might see a little bit more action. Anyway, Rafiki Dave, how's your leopard search going? Well, my search is going well, and we just uh, met to the bush team before going home. And the saying they got a feeling the tracks they saw early of the leopard must be Hukumuri. Chances are it was a male leopard, and they think. It must be Hukumuri, and the drainage line they think it went is where we are heading to now and chancing if he could be there. What we want to do, we'll drive every three, five minutes, stop and switch off the car because it's like now they start showing. <laughs> did that sound like a leopard or did that sound something different? I don't know. Final control, what do you think? Yeah, the thing's not bad. So we're going to the drainage area where Taylor think uh, Hukumuri might have entered and we go park and either look and listen carefully if any sewing or any alarm calls, for example, from Kudus, which happen to be very reliable. We are, of course, on our lights now. And today I don't think I'm looking for chameleons or for scrub hairs. Today I'm looking for something like a pangolin. I'm not sure if that sounds possible or something like an advac. I think we are always looking for chameleons and scrub hairs and night jars. I want to look for something tough. Marco, yes, you're asking where they are. You know, you just learned about the pangolin. Are they in the Kruger? Yes, they are there and very difficult to see. You, the only in, they're very nocturnal and only come out at night. I thought I am not talking about scrub hairs, but there is one. Yes, Marco, we have them and we have them in the Kruger. Pangolins are here where we are. If today is our lucky day, we might see one. I might swallow my words having said I'm not looking for scrub hairs. This scrub hair looked for me. I did not look for it. Simply because it came on the road. 
or not very far from the road. So, Marco, yes, we have pangolins, very nocturnal, very funny looking animals, I would say, a kind of mammals when you see them. You see how they roll themselves when threatened. They look like a ball, they look like a ball with all the scales on their bodies. And they dig burrows, very deep burrows. When you see them digging burrows and, they, you know, if you find them in their burrow, it's a burrow you can stand in. I don't know how tall Marco you are, but if you get to see a barrow of a pangolin, they are so huge, and you can stand inside. A normal human being, say five feet, five inches or so, you can stand inside a barrow of a pangolin. Why they make them so huge, I do not know. I'm not sure it's about air conditioning, there were lots of air in there, but if you can slide through slowly, the barrow, the entrance, the hole is not big, but once inside, it's like a cave, huge. Well, the scrub here, they are getting some rhizomes, digging some rhizomes from the ground. Or roots of grasses, they also eat lots of stems. Also nocturnal, like the pangolins. Big ears, big eyes, you can see very bright. They, still, they always need those ears as big as they are to be able to pick any sound jumps away and a threat. They'll need the ears to pick in a slight sound. When you've got leopards like Hukumuri, you'd imagine leopard like Hukumuri going for one of these. That should be like a quick snack. All right, let's go to our plan of our drainage area and hopefully we don't see more of this. Thames have their night jaws in South Africa. Lots of them, lots of them, lots of night jaws. And this is like the time James, they like coming out. They'll be in the middle of the road there uh, because the heat of the day, the sun, you know, have heated the ground or the soil. It's pretty warm. So you always see them coming on the road, staying on the ground, picking a bit of warmth from the substrate. Sometimes you see them, you know, dust by thing. They are on the road. And once they finish that, of course, their feathers look very unkept. And then you'll see the night jars. They have one very special tool uh, that have something like a comb in it. You see the same night just just trying to groom themselves combing their feathers. It's quite something. What, should we see that, James? This could be one of the days you see that. If you see, you'll be very lucky. But yes, we got lots of night jars in South Africa and roads like this is where you'd see them right in the middle. Big whiskers they got, which they use when they go open their mouth and they go feeding as they catch flies at night and then come early morning at dawn, they, at dawn they'll go and back to the trees and they blend in very well you see them in the trees you might easily miss them all right see i don't know how my pangolins are or my advocs are when i shine that maybe a chameleon might pop up and rough, got a leopard. <laughs> and we've still got the same leopard. Well, we've got two, but they're not very active just yet. But well, I'm just sitting here hoping that maybe there will be something. I'm not hoping that a hyena comes running in to steal their food, but I'm just hoping that something, something happens here nothing might happen but uh, it's been a while since i did uh, see tandi and Tlalamba, so i'm not going to be going anywhere just yet i think we'll be staying here till the end because they might have a feed they might do something for us and well even if they do nothing it's still wonderful to be in their presence and you know i might not see them for another month so i'm just making the best of it and obviously you see that reflection in their eyes. That's um, just from this infrared. They're not seeing any light at the moment. It's totally dark, um, but it's this very special light that um, reflects into the back of their eyes, this infrared light that makes it possible for us to see them in the dark. So if I look away from our little screen here in the front, I can't even see Tandi or Tlalamba. It's quite fascinating and wonderful, actually, that you can actually do that. And I don't need to shine the light on them. So 
So you always notice when the other game drive vehicles come and then you then you notice their spotlights because they they obviously don't have the luxury of being able to look at the little screen like I do. And why would you want to come on safari anyway and stare at a little screen? You might as well stay at home. So they're sitting in the back of the vehicle and um, they need to use that spotlight to show everyone what they're looking at. And so you do try not to shine straight in their face. You try and bounce the light off the ground. And sometimes, but it's a, it's a debatable subject. There's some guys that say, you know, put on this blue filter. Um, it's, it, you know, it doesn't affect the animals as much. Some of the guys say red filter. Um, some of the guys say that the white doesn't make a difference and uh, putting on these different filters is... is, is um, not doesn't make a difference at all so uh, i'm not quite sure i'm not sold on any of the, the the topics i just think that not shining any of those lights directly in their face is the best bet oh dandy's up what she noticed now it's always a bit of a worrying um type of you know uh, concentration that she, she seems to do especially when you're around a kill like this there is a little bit of a breeze and the smell of this carcass can be drifting and hyenas will pick it up so will jackals so it's only a matter of time before some scavengers do start to make their way into this area and it's that time of the night that they'll be lurking they'll be active and they'll be walking around trying to smell for things and meat and fresh meat or even rotting meat or any kind of meat they are extreme carnivores so uh, hyenas are on the prowl and that's um, sooner or later they're going to get found out Tandy you're going to have to have your wits about you because you're just leaving this meat on the ground I know why you're doing it but you're leaving yourself exposed to hyena so you can't go fully to sleep. Katie, that's that's an interesting one to say. Yeah, night vision goggles should be provided to guests. I agree with you, Katie. Absolutely, but um, they don't come cheap. Um, but that is a that's a good idea. I, I I really like that. Another thing that is also starting. Um, to make its way in but it's only the top end lodges i think king's camp uh, which is probably one of the if not the most expensive lodge around um they they and i also know there's another couple of very expensive lodges that um that uh, host celebrities and and you know all the, the very um rich people they have um, also started to test electric um, land drivers and game game viewers so you're totally silent and uh, you don't make all the startup noise and so on um, i know that it's in its infancy once again because you need the torque and the power for you know four by fouring etc and but i know that they're getting there and that would then be the ultimate imagine having an electric game viewer with night vision goggles and drones that you know but you see where do you where do you draw the line but i think that night vision goggles and electric vehicles that, those two there's there's not really anything ethical about that that we need to worry about um and i think it could definitely be applied but as i say for now quite expensive both the electric vehicles and the night vision goggles so very good potential for the high-end lodges but uh, take a while to trickle down to the to the sort of um, more budget type experiences and like especially for locals south africans you know it's um, not as easy to go and experience uh, wildlife uh, anymore in south africa you know unless you, you're earning yourself a good salary and and all of that it's um it's quite an expensive affair so and then you know they can't really afford your average job Bob on, the, on, you know, can't afford to go to any of these expensive lodges, so it's always going to be just your general vehicle and, um, and yeah, not night vision. You're going to have the spotlight. So, but sooner or later, hopefully it trickles through. But even those budget type safaris, they're also assisting massively in, in conservation uh, as opposed to hunting. Uh, it would be a much better line if we could make all the money through that. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, there's, there's all different angles of conservation and uh, some people agree with all of them, some not. And there's uh, lots of different opinions, but that's, that's what they are. We're all entitled to them. Anyway, uh, we're not going anywhere. Neither are these cats for now. I will let you know as soon as something happens. But let's head you off to Rafiki Dave, who's also on the prowl. Yes, I am here. We've been trying to listen to any audio, any calls from leopards. Nothing at the moment. But from a distance, I just heard from the Game Drive radio, there was a, a loud call of a leopard, but a long way from where we are. But then it just sold once, and then it kept quiet. So we're trying to follow our own and see whether it will bear any fruit. And slowly driving, stop listening. But I'm sure once we hear it sowing once, we'll definitely be able to get it. And either way, I forgot what I had said that I wouldn't look for scrub hairs or camellos because I wanted to look at pangolins and advocs, which I know that's quite a tall order. And I'm swallowing my water. What I'm doing, I'm just now looking for the chameleons and the scrub hairs. I saw some scrub hairs, so now I won't concentrate on some chameleons. And maybe add to that list, Nigers. I'll be happy to see a Nigger doing some dust bathing and then combing or just maintaining its feathers with its very special toe that has like a comb on it. Owls, none. I'll be happy to see Veros all. Also this time, Veros all normally come out at night, especially the large ones coming to look for small mammals or large insects. Looking on top of trees, very good idea. Bush babies also could be another interesting thing. Lori, you're asking, can we see bush babies? Yes, the only thing is, or the only concern about bush babies, they're very jumpy. I don't know whether that makes sense. They never settle down. See them? You put the camera on them, the next split of a second, they're gone. They go, they settle somewhere, you see them, you put the camera there, then they're gone. But yes, if you are lucky, we'll show you some uh, bush babies. We'll always fast spot some orange eyes at night, and those will be bush babies jumping from one tree to another. I don't know whether you know, comment why we call them bush babies. Any idea? Tell me an answer if you know why we call them bush babies. Chameleons, where are you today? Nothing sewing at the moment, it's very quiet. We'll try and switch off the car here for a few seconds and just listen until you can just hear the silence of this beautiful world we are in. almost pitch black and that's the best you can see like where Craig is showing on the camera that's the best if he switches off that infrared it will be so dark to see anything so this is the beauty of where we are and we just listen now to cicadas crickets or we're just calling and all the life the people who are always in command during the day and are slowly facing off and the ones in charge at night they're coming in all right, we'll keep looking. We have time to get a surprise in the last minute and my spotlight on. Linda, very well done. Excellent. And that's why they're called bush babies. Well done, well done. You must have been to Africa, Linda, and maybe you had them, you know, crying. You're very right. Yes, because when they communicate when they call each other when they got business to do their call is just like for human babies excellent well done I one time did a safari with some guests and I think they came from London and I found out much later 
this particular guest had never been not only to Africa, not only any other part of Europe. They were born in London, bred there, went to school there and grew there. And they have never been out of London, which was quite unusual. And what happened is the first time they came out, not out of the UK, the first time they came out of the city London, they came to Africa on a safari. And we were doing what we call fly camping or, you know, why we would go and pitch tents anywhere in the middle of the wilderness. And we went, we had dinner and some little campfire and did a bit of briefing, you know, things to expect at night. Took the morning call, wake up, we'll want some coffee in the morning, we'll want some tea in the morning, we'll want some blood mary in the morning, and we all slept. It was one couple, <clears throat> and they had just married, and the following morning, the butler came and woke me up around 5.15. The wake-up call for them was about 6 o'clock, but by 5 o'clock, they were up, and they had their luggage ready. And I asked them, well, what's the problem? They said, home. And what do you mean home? We won't go back to the, to the UK now. Why? And they said, I got a feeling here, you people, you kill children or you murder children. There are so many babies crying at night, which even never saw when we came in. It took me about three hours to convince them, you know, those were bush babies. And I had to get a call for bush babies for them to continue enjoying the safari. Yeah, that was interesting. It is, it is. And uh, I would, uh, yeah, Castor says it's crazy from final control. you got people who have never been to Africa. Linda, you imagine you have never had bush babies crying and you come, you have taken dinner and you've gone to bed and then you hear children crying at night. I mean, it's your first time to come to Africa from a big city like London or New York or Washington, Paris. You, you'll have every reason to think you know, there were babies that you never saw anywhere, and to be convinced they're not, it's not easy. And especially if you have not have done any research <laughs> or any homework about safari or about Africa or what to expect, you know? Quite interesting. We have also had guests at, at times who will say when they hear the school at night, they, they talk of its hyenas. I mean, hyenas, it's women, you know, people who are screaming at night. Let's go back to Ruff and find out his latest with the leopard. Okay. Well, uh, there is no change here. Uh, maybe just slightly in the pace that Tundi is breathing. Her breathing seems to have slowed a little bit. So she is looking a lot more comfortable and looking like she's fading into a deeper sleep but she needs to keep her wits about her because like i said there could be some hyenas lurking and i'm sure they're going to pick up on the smell of this open carcass which is lying here and the, the blood that has been spilt of this uh, young bush bush buck so both Tandi and Tlalamba are very happily lazing here in the grass. And, well, Tlalamba still got her little prize of the head of the, well, the head and neck uh, area of the, of the little bushbuck. Maybe just make it out behind her there. There's her spots. You can only just make her out as well. She's also now drifted off completely. And I could just see the meat there a little bit earlier in the in the light but it's not very easy now no, it's not very easy under this kind of conditions but it is there just behind Salamba so she'd be guarding that I wonder if mom comes if she's going to react the same as mom did when she came to get the meat <laughs> but if it's a hyena they're going to scatter hopefully Tandy gets the meat before but at least they've both had a very good feed anyway. So regardless of if they get chased off this meat, they've pretty much had their fill. Uh, it would just be nice for them to sleep off some of this meat, maybe go to the toilet, and then they could feed again. So, you know, it's a couple of meals in it. Whereas now they've had a full meal, maybe a little bit more than that, 
and then uh, they could extend that life of this carcass a little bit further because it's big enough to feed these two cats a couple of times so but uh, I wonder when we're gonna see you two again are you gonna make your way back to Biffles Hook and uh, Gwari Pan Road or are you gonna hang around here on Chitwa Chitwa my feeling is you're gonna finish this and you're gonna head back that way uh, but you never know everyone it all remains to be seen tomorrow morning I have a feeling we might get lucky and they're here but uh, I have a feeling they're not going to be they're gonna either get chased off here by hyenas or they're just gonna um, voluntarily move off on their own now we are starting to head towards the end of the show and it's been another wonderful day's safari we're heading towards full moon so it's going to be a lovely warm and bright evening there's not a cloud in the sky it's actually very beautiful the sun is completely set um, and I would just want to say thanks to all the guides that were out today Rafiki Dave and to Taylor out on on foot um, thanks to all the ladies and guys in FC um, and thanks to all of course the cam ops especially mine who was very good today and most of all thanks to you the viewers uh, that makes this all possible don't forget to join us tomorrow for another safari goodbye for now everybody and have a nice evening